Folks, it's time. It's been years since we lashed in on Kratos and his God Ending Crusade. Now it's 2023, God of War Ragnarok has been out, and I know y'all been waiting for your favorite lore professor to drop an updated history lecture. Well, the wait is over. Today on Honest Gaming History, we're hopping back into Olympus and the Nine Realms to go over the entire God of War story. And for those worried about missing context because of my last two God of War lore videos, don't worry. I'll be explaining everything as if you've never even heard of Kratos before. So watching those videos won't be necessary. With all that being said, sit back, relax, get some snacks, and enjoy one of the greatest stories ever told in gaming history. This is the complete lore of God of War. Now we can't talk about God of War without bringing up the studio that made it all possible, Santa Monica Studio. Founded in 1999 by veteran Sony employee Alan Becker, the studio was made to help the crew step away from the corporate heavy environment they were in working right under Sony Computer Entertainment. They started off as neighbors of Naughty Dog, the studio behind hits like The Last of Us and Uncharted, then later moved to their own crib in Santa Monica, California. As they established their team, they stressed the importance of having an environment where everyone could collaborate and communicate freely. In an interview done by IGN with former studio head Shannon Studstill, she said, One of the key things for us at the time was open communication. We really wanted to have a collaborative environment. No walls, no barriers between desks and that sort of thing. Sounds like a pretty dope setup to me. But just being creative and open wasn't enough. They needed a game. They had to show Sony that they could drop some heat. The first title they worked on was a racing game called Kinetica. They released it for PS2 in 2001, and it was met with pretty good reviews. However, Kinetica was just a test run. They never had plans on making it any more than what it was. In the same IGN interview, Stud still said, For me, the memory of Kinetica was shipping it on time and on schedule. Just really that kind of production machine part, proving to Sony that we could ship something on time and stay within budget. But in this case, we stayed under budget, which I'm surprisingly still proud of. As you should, Shannon. Completing a game under budget is huge. And you guys were new to this too? That's a big W. But with the test run out of the way, it was time for them to show their true potential with their second game, God of War. The concept was the brainchild of David Jaffe, the director of that wild-ass vehicular combat game that some of you guys may remember called Twisted Metal. He was inspired by the original Clash of the Titans movie and the Capcom title Onimusha. Development started in 2002 with the working title being Dark Odyssey. Damn, even now that name would still hold up. I still think Fuck Them Gods the adventure game would have made more sense though. I mean, that is Kratos' mentality. Anyway, the game was built on the same engine used for Kinetica. Once it dropped in 2005, to their surprise, it did extremely well. Like, this shit changed the game, folks. The best way to sum it up is with this quote from a review from Gaming Age. The complete package, and I believe it's the best game on the PS2. The gameplay is gripping and the story is so good, my wife wouldn't let me play through the end of the game without her present. When you got couples binging your game together, you know you're onto something. God of War's success allowed them to expand upon the series with multiple games, novels, and comics. Now, about 18 years later, the God of War franchise is seen as one of the best in gaming history. But you guys probably already knew that. So without much further ado, let's talk about what you guys really came for. That juicy plot. And for that, we must begin with how the God of War world came to be. It's time to talk about the Primordials. Before there were Titans, or even Gods, there were the Primordials, cosmic beings made by the very fabric of the universe. For whatever reason, a lot of these guys came out the gate hating each other. This sparked a war between them that lasted for an eternity. The war was so real, it gave birth to the Furies, beings who served no one and acted as the Guardians of Honor. Eventually, the majority of the Primordials wiped themselves out, with each one creating gargantuan landscapes as they fell. This gave rise to the next overpowered being from the planet, the Titans. These guys were born on the island of creation, the origin of all life on Earth. This place was also home to the Sisters of Fate, three Primordials who had control over time. The Titans finished creating the rest of the world, and lived a lot better than the Primordials, but their leader, Kronos, was all shaken up because of rumors of his downfall. 
it was prophesied that he would be overthrown by his children. Kronos was trying to have that, so he attempted to bribe the Sisters of Fate. But they were like, nah bro, we don't give a crap if you're the leader of the Titans. Even if you were a primordial, we still wouldn't do shit for you. So with few options left, this dude Kronos decided to start eating his kids. Well, that's one way to solve your problems. His wife, Rhea, was sick of watching him devour her babies, so she hid her sixth and last child, Zeus, in the mountains. There he was raised by his grandmother, Gaia, the primordial goddess of Earth and mother of the Titans. One training arc later, Zeus returned to declare war against the Titans and save his siblings. All this fighting further shaped the landscape of the world. So when you think about it, the primordials made the canvas that is the world, the Titans threw paint on it, then the Great Titan War cleaned everything up. To end the war, Zeus created the Blade of Olympus to throw the Titans into the Shadow Realm. And by Shadow Realm, we mean Tartarus, a prison located in the deepest part of the underworld. Once finished, Zeus and his fellow gods established their new home on Mount Olympus. And from there, they watch over the mortals who traverse the world they helped create. Well, until some of them decided to start shapeshifting into mortals themselves and banging whoever they wanted. Some of these gods were horny as fuck. But little did they know that that same horniness would lead to their downfall. Because one of the demigods born from this was the God Slayer himself, Kratos. Kratos was born in the Greek city-state of Sparta to his mother Callisto and the King of Gods, Zeus. That's wild because as the King of Gods, you'd think he'd want to set a good example. You know, show them what it means to be wise, prudent, and all that responsible shit. But nah, homie made a second head thing for him. As a Spartan, it's kind of your job to always be ready to throw hands. Spartan children were trained in the art of war at an early age, so Kratos was fighting all the time. His training partner was Deimos, his younger brother with an odd birthmark. They share the same dream of joining the Spartan army as adults. But that shit was way too wholesome for this plot. Y'all thought you could have dreams and shit? Stop it! Back on Mount Olympus, Zeus starts hearing prophecies about his demise by the hands of one of his sons, specifically the one with the mark. Zeus doesn't want to get the Kronos treatment, so he sends Athena, the goddess of wisdom, and Ares, the god of war, to hunt down the son of prophecy. Without wasting any time, the two gods raid Sparta and grab Deimos because of his birthmark, but Kratos isn't about to let these guys take his bro. He comes at Ares with all his might, but the god slaps him away, leaving a brutal scar on his face. Ares almost ends the boy's life here, but luckily Athena stops him saying they got what they came for. With that, they leave, and Kratos vows to never falter again. And as a tribute to his brother, he paints his birthmark over his body. This brings us to the God of War comic, originally published by Wildstorm. Years go by. And over time, Kratos becomes a monster in the Spartan army. Like, this man cannot be beat. But he still feels a void inside. The Endless Ws weren't doing much for him. This is until he meets his partner, Lysandra. They get married and for once, Kratos feels content with life. But these vibes get slapped away almost immediately when Lysandra gives birth to their daughter, Calliope. She comes out the womb infected by a plague that has cursed the Spartans for some time. And because the Spartans believe in alpha mentality, they're like, shit, she's got the plague. That means she's weak. We gotta kill her for Sparta. At first, Kratos acquiesces, but he and his wife hear about this miracle cure known as Ambrosia. Not only would it be able to cure their daughter, but it could also make Sparta the strongest it's ever been. So with his wife's blessings, he sets out to find the Ambrosia. However, the Spartan higher-ups tell him that he has until the rising of the first full moon to complete his quest. If he fails, his daughter's life is clipped. What makes this so hilarious, though, is that some of the gods watch all this happen, they start placing bets on who they think will get to the Ambrosia first. Ares is putting his money on Kratos, while the other gods place bets on separate warriors seeking the miracle cure. Kratos is just trying to cure his daughter, and these gods are treating it like a sports game. You hate to see it. Oh, and you forgot to mention how some of these gods used the plague to force oh their God. warriors to go on this quest. Like Poseidon, god of the seas, straight up admits to being responsible for casting the plague on his warrior's village. We haven't even gotten to any of the games yet and these gods are already on the foulest timing. So Kratos takes down pretty much all the warriors after the Ambrosia until he gets to the barbarian prince, Auric, the champion of the god of the underworld. Hades. Poor Auric is only here because Hades secretly gave his father the plague, so the two warriors fight for the sake of saving their loved ones. It's a tough battle, but Kratos ends up winning in the end and claiming the Ambrosia for Sparta. He heads home and heals his daughter, then gets promoted to captain by the king of Sparta himself. However, Auric is still alive, and now he's beyond pissed at Kratos and hungry for revenge. He keeps his head low for now, but he'll be back real soon. As captain of the Spartan army, Kratos leads a whole crusade to the world the power of Sparta but with each win, his bloodthirst increases. His wife begs him to stop, 
but he's not trying to hear it. The void of not having a family is gone, so he's back to wanting nothing but smoke. However, his conquest has stopped dead in his tracks once the barbarian king, Ulrich, makes his return. Told y'all he'd be back soon. With a larger army, Ulrich and his men overpower the Spartans easily. Then Ulrich prepares to lay the finishing blow on Kratos. But our boy decides to make the biggest mistake of his life. In desperation, he calls on Ares to help him out. In return for victory, he pledges his undying allegiance. This sad man just signed his life away to the same asshole who kidnapped his brother, slapped the shit out of him, and casually bet on his life when he was trying to cure his daughter. If only you knew, Kratos. Ares hears the call and is like, say less. Then he murders all the barbarians in Auric's army. Following the genocide, Kratos is granted the Blades of Chaos as a symbol of his servitude. He then uses his new toys to slay Auric. Now, you'd think Kratos would learn his lesson after this. Homie got too kill happy and it almost led to his death. The only reason he's alive right now is because of a god, and you never want to be on a god's payroll. But nah, instead of chilling with the killing, Kratos gets even more kill happy and continues his conquest with more gusto. This time he's doing it all in the name of Ares. He causes so much chaos that his name begins to be feared across the land. Stay away from this crazy ass bald dude with chain swords. I don't know what his problem is, but he will kill you. Then, the day that changes everything arrives. Kratos pulls up to a village with Athena worshippers, and as usual, commands his army to burn it to the ground for Ares. He makes it to the temple where he meets the village's oracle, and she warns him about continuing. Kratos himself even feels it in his gut that he should probably stop, but the need to stab people overcomes him. He enters the temple, and in a blind fury, murders everyone there. But when he finishes, he realizes that two of the many people he killed were his wife and his daughter. Before all this, the bitch-ass god Ares secretly teleported his family to this temple knowing full well that Kratos was on his way here to slaughter shit. Then when Ares explains himself to Kratos, he tells him this was the only way to sever his ties from the mortals. I mean, I'm not Kratos, but I know my man didn't ask for any of this. With that, Kratos renounces his allegiance to Ares. Then to add insult to injury, the oracle curses Kratos to wear the ashes of his family forever, making his skin pale as the moon. Now, as the ghost of Sparta, Kratos leaves the village hurt, betrayed, and pissed. The only thing on his mind is vengeance. Now we're finally at the first game in the series chronologically, God of War Ascension. It was released in 2013 for the PS3. After the death of his family, Kratos doesn't do much except for sulk. He's constantly hit by illusions of the past that only drags him down further. But things are about to get way worse for him since he basically told Ares to screw himself. Y'all remember the Furies? The ones responsible for making sure people keep their word? Well, it turns out they're cool with Ares, so now they're after Kratos. Luckily for our boy, he finds an ally in a mysterious man named Orcos. He warns Kratos of the illusions he's seeing and tells him to seek the truth by speaking with the Oracle of Delphi. He brute forces his way through tons of enemies and illusions till he makes it to her. She tells him that the Furies are the reason for his illusions. They're clouding his mind because he doesn't mess with Ares anymore. The only way to free his mind is to defeat the Furies, and to do that, he needs to find the Eyes of Truth in Delos. With that, Kratos leaves to go on another fetch quest. He's stopped by Orcos, but Kratos doesn't trust him. Thanks to the Oracle's explanation, Kratos found out that the guy is half Fury. So to clear his name, he tells Kratos his backstory. Apparently, Ares has been plotting to take over Mount Olympus for some time now. However, there's a strict rule against gods fighting other gods. So, Ares decides to sleep with the Queen of Furies, Electo, to spawn the ultimate warrior for their task. Homie was pretty much trying to breed for the best dads. But the child they produced was Orcos, and he didn't fit Ares' vision of the perfect warrior. So the bastard just owned his son like the shitty ass god he is. Following this, poor Orcos volunteered to become the Oath Keeper because he just wanted to please those he thought loved him. However, all that changed once he peeped how they did Kratos dirty. He goes on to reveal to Kratos that Ares planned on using him as his warrior of choice to take over Mount Olympus, since the Orcos plan didn't pan out. That's why he had him killing all those innocents along with his family. It was all a goddamn test. Imagine finding out the only reason your family died was because some higher being wanted to test you. Bro, the whole Greek pantheon would have to see me with the hands. So now Orcos is a part of the Screw the Gods and Furies crew and is down to help Kratos. But the Spartan doesn't want the help of a Fury, so Orcos just leaves. After a long trip overseas, Kratos makes it to Delos, but he's jumped by all the Furies. During the skirmish, he manages to cut off Megara's arm, but the Furies still manage to pin him down. Fortunately, Orcos comes in clutch and saves him from them. Now Kratos is more accepting of the help. Together they make it to the Eyes of Truth, where we find out that these eyes actually used to belong to the Oracle of Delphi. See, Orcos first found out about Ares' Mount Olympus plan from the Oracle. 
He saw the truth through her eyes, so they teamed up to try and stop it before Ares gained the chance to make it happen. But the Furies caught wind of this and ripped out the Oracle's eyes in response. These Furies are savages, bro. Anyway, with the eyes of truth in grasp, it looks like things may finally work out for Kratos. But the Furies show up with the captured Orcos to kill our hopes. They imprison and torture Kratos for two weeks. They continue to show him fake, happy illusions of his past, promising that returning to Ares will grant him all of this and more. But Kratos' fury is stronger than they anticipated. He manages to break out of his prison, then one by one he eviscerates the Furies. Serves them right. With that, Kratos returns to Orcos, who's now officially the bro. But Kratos isn't allowed to have a happy ending. Orcos reveals that right before the Furies died, they made him Kratos' Oath Keeper. Now, the only way for Kratos to gain true freedom is to kill his new friend. Initially, Kratos refuses. He's already taken so many innocent lives, but Orcos urges him to do the deed nonetheless. If he doesn't, then he'll be tortured by Ares for all of eternity anyway. So against his will, Kratos ends Orcos' life. Then to make matters worse, the truth of what he did to his family comes rushing in to replace all the illusions he was seeing. Now, Kratos is not only alone, but he has to fully deal with the nightmarish acts he committed under the control of the God of War. This next part of Kratos' Dark Odyssey is covered in God of War Chains of Olympus, the first PSP game released for the series. It's been five years since Kratos' bout with the Furies. Since the reality of what he did continued to haunt him, he was desperate to find a way to get rid of them. So he started serving the gods in hopes that they would eventually free him of his nightmares. Not what I would have done, but hey, live your best life, Kratos. Now, under the command of the gods, he's defending Attica against the invading Persian army. After completing his mission by taking down the leader, he screams at the gods like, Y'all got more shit for me to do? My schedule's open and I'm not trying to be left alone with my thoughts. Then in response, the sun straight up falls from the sky and leaves the world in complete darkness. That's odd. Kratos goes into detective mode and follows the last bit of light to figure out what the hell's going on. His sleuthing brings him to the temple of Helios, where he begins hearing the familiar tune of a flute. With no idea of where it's coming from or what it means, he continues investigating. He runs into Athena and she's like, Bro, Olympus is screwed and we need your help. Someone snatched Helios, the god of the sun, from the sky. Now Morpheus, the god of dreams, is trying to flex. He put the gods into a deep slumber and is covering the rest of the world in his black fog. Now I know you don't like us, but you do not want Morpheus in charge. With that, Kratos is tasked with saving Helios and stopping Morpheus. He continues traveling through the temple of Helios till he finds Eos, Helios' sister. She tells him that the titan Atlas broke out of Tartarus and took her brother. She doesn't know where they went, but if he finds Helios' fire steeds, they'll take him to their master. So our boy goes on another search while taking out as many minions of Morpheus as he can. And that familiar tune periodically bothers him while he's at it. He eventually realizes this was the melody that his daughter Calliope used to play. The black fog is causing him to hear things. Regardless, he collects the fire seeds and they take him to the underworld. There he meets Charon, the ferryman of the underworld. Kratos isn't supposed to be here yet so they fight, and Charon whoops that ass and sends him deeper into the underworld. But nothing holds Kratos for long. He fights his way through the underworld, snags the Gauntlet of Zeus, runs it back with Charon and wins, then continues looking for Atlas. His search is once again interrupted by Calliope's melody, but this time the illusion is even stronger, because he actually sees his daughter. Seemingly forgetting about his original mission, he follows his daughter till he finds Persephone, the wife of Hades. Now, fun fact about Persephone, her life utterly sucks. In actual Greek mythology, Persephone was a goddess of spring's bounty. However, one day, Hades, with the help of Zeus, kidnapped her to make her his wife. Persephone's mother, Demeter, the goddess of agriculture, was obviously pissed about this. And when she found out Zeus was partially responsible, it only made her more pissed. So she refused to allow the earth to bear fruit until her daughter was returned to her. But Persephone had already eaten food from Hades, so for some reason she wasn't allowed to leave. As a compromise, she was given the chance to temporarily leave Hades once a year. Her annual return was marked by the growing of plants and flowering of meadows. So in Greek mythology, this became the story behind the season of spring. However, most Greek myths have multiple renditions, so this is just one of the many stories told about Persephone. Back to the plot, Kratos tells Persephone that he saw his daughter and he wants to see her now. But her soul is in the Elysium Fields, a section of the afterlife separate from the underworld, meant to shelter the souls of the heroic and righteous. To enter, Kratos must relinquish his weapons, but he's warned that the choice may doom the world. He's straight up abandoning his main mission. But Kratos doesn't give a shit. He's like, the gods keep playing me, and I'm gonna be honest, Earth can kiss the underside of my left nutsack. I just want my goddamn daughter. So Kratos does what he's told, and is reunited with his daughter, but this was all a trap. 
Persephone comes in like, you thought I was feeling you? I'm the one who freed Atlas. And now that he has Helios, he's going to destroy the pillar that holds the world. Pretty ironic since in mythology, Atlas is the one responsible for holding up the skies. Now he's tearing it down. Kratos hears this and is like, wait, you do know that we all die if the pillar of the world breaks, right? Are you out of your mind? But Persephone's like, I don't care. You think I like being Hades' wife? You think I like the fact that Zeus and the gods just let this happen to me when we used to be cool? Nah, I don't care about living after this. I just want revenge. So here we have another case of why the gods needs to stop messing with people. This shows Kratos the error in his ways. His destiny is not with his daughter, as much as he wants it to be. But he can't do anything since he's in the Elysium Fields. So he does the opposite of what gets you here. He starts sinning. First, through a fucking QTE, he pushes his daughter away. Then he proceeds to murder every single spirit in the fields. God damn, homie went straight to work. After getting his weapons back and ignoring Calliope's cries for him to stop, he leaves to go kill Persephone. Another god kill later, he confronts Atlas, who is now stuck holding the pillar of the world. The Titan asks Kratos if he really thinks the Olympians will keep their promise of relinquishing his nightmares. And Kratos is like, they better. Then Atlas tells him they'll regret doing what he did, and they'll meet again. With that, Kratos takes Helios' chariot and brings his son back to where it belongs. He falls from the sky unsatisfied with everything that has happened so far. It's almost like he knows the gods won't keep their end of the bargain. Once he hits land, Athena and Helios take his weapons and leave him there to rest. The gods will need him again soon. Aight, we finally made it to the first God of War. It's been 10 years since Kratos started working for the gods. And he's still out here doing crap for them in the hopes that they'll free him from his past. After slaying the Hydra for them, he blows off some steam with two random women, if you catch my drift. But the nightmares ruin his nut. So he calls for Athena and asks her what else he needs to do for the gods to end his torture. She tells him that his final quest is to find Pandora's box and use his power to defeat Ares. Apparently, homie threw away the plan he had back in God of War Ascension, and now he's just attacking the places that worship the other gods. He's invading Athens as they speak. So Kratos, being a mortal trained by a god, is the only one who can stop him. He's down to kill the god for obvious reasons, but before he leaves, he's like, okay, and if I do this, you guys are for sure gonna take away my nightmares, right? But Athena, with all the sus energy in the world, is like, yeah, sure, all your past sins will be forgiven or whatever. Just handle this Ares business ASAP. With that, Kratos says to Athens. There he takes out a bunch of Ares' forces, and in the process receives new powers from the gods. At least they're helping him. His journey brings him to this odd gravedigger who mentioned that he's digging this grave for him. Kratos leaves him baffled by this comment, but before he departs, the digger says, And when all appears to be lost, Kratos, I will be there to help. Kratos still has no idea what he's talking about, but it's obvious this dude is sus as hell. Eventually, Kratos finds the Oracle of Athens. She looks into his past and after seeing the horrific acts he committed, she's like, Whoa! Why the hell would Athena send you of all people to save Athens? You're crazy! But Kratos is like, Bitch, stop looking in my head and tell me where I'm supposed to go. She tells him that he'll find Pandora's box in Pandora's temple. Wow, Kratos couldn't figure that one out. But she warns that no one has ever survived going through its trials. Kratos shrugs off the warning and continues. After days of travel, he makes it there. He fights through the temple, then finally claims the box. But little did he know, Ares is aware of this plan the whole time. All the way from Athens, the God of War chucks a huge pillar at Kratos, piercing him right through the chest. With that, the ghost of Sparta dies as Ares' harpies take the box. But Kratos' willpower knows no bounds. He manages to stop his ascent into the underworld, then he climbs back up into the world of the living. Homie really died and said, Bitch, you thought! And oddly enough, he climbs through the same hole the mysterious gravedigger was digging a little while ago. Kratos asks how this is possible, and all the digger says is, Athena isn't the only god watching after him. Turns out this guy's actually Zeus. Dude is looking out for his son this whole time. But don't get it twisted. Zeus is still the scum of the earth. Anyway, now that the ghost of Sparta is back in the fight, he takes Pandora's box back and uses it to get on Ares' level. The two duke it out, and after a long battle, Kratos comes out on top using the Blade of the Gods. After killing the God of War, Kratos returns to Athena to claim his prize. But this bitch tells Kratos that even though the gods are indebted to him, they never promise to free him from his nightmares. They can only forgive his sins. So outside of getting revenge, all that he went through is pretty much for nothing. With little to live for, Kratos attempts to unalive himself, but he's saved by Athena. She's like, hold up, we may not be able to end your nightmares, but how about becoming a god? I mean, you did kill Ares, so it's only fair. The ghost of Sparta accepts his consolation prize, then sits on his throne as a new god of war. 
The next part of this chapter takes us back to the God of War comic published by Wildstorm. See, that comic follows two stories. The one we covered was a flashback, but the one we're about to talk about now is the main story. But it involves Kratos doing the same thing, searching for Ambrosia. Since it's known as a miracle cure, the followers of Ares want to use it to revive their fallen god. But y'all know Kratos can't have that, so this time he's out to destroy the Ambrosia. Against the wishes of his now fellow gods, he fights through a bunch of obstacles, including the undead army of his comrades who join him on his first Ambrosia quest. Eventually, he finds what he's looking for being guarded by Gyges, the Hecatonkeres. The Hecatonkeres are deformed giants with 50 heads and hundreds of arms. They were born from the primordial Oranos, but later banished to Tartarus because of how hideous they were. Well, sorry I'm ugly, Dad. Gyges is trying to use the Ambrosia for himself to revive his brothers and take over the world, but he's unable to stop Kratos who burns all the Ambrosia along with Gyges using Apollo's flame. With that, Kratos moves on knowing he won't have to worry about Ares ever coming back. Good riddance. Now let's talk about God of War Ghost of Sparta. This is a PSP title that dropped in 2010. Kratos is still getting hit by his constant wild visions, but among them, he keeps seeing his mother in prison in the Temple of Poseidon. Knowing these visions must mean something more, he heads for Atlantis. Athena tries telling him to stop, but he's too salty about the gods not taking away his nightmares to care. Eventually, he finds his mother, Callisto, who has a lot to tell him. First of all, his brother is still alive. After Ares and Athena took him, they trapped him in Death's domain to be tortured. She asks Kratos to go and save him. But our boy's confused as hell. He gets pissed at his mom asking her why she lied about Deimos' death all this time. She tells him that his father, the same person that put her here, forced her to keep this all a secret. Then Kratos finally asks who his father is, but while trying to tell him, Callisto morphs into a monster and attacks her son. The ghost of Sparta is then forced to kill his own mother out of self-defense. Her dying wish? Save Deimos. But you don't have to tell Kratos twice. First, he found out his brother was still alive. Now, thanks to the gods, his mother has been killed by his own hands. Our boy is beyond pissed. The game itself says his rage is almost palpable. So Kratos does what he must to gain access to Death's domain. Athena tries dissuading him every chance she gets, but she's always met with the Fuck you, Athena! All you gots do is lie! from Kratos. In due time, Kratos makes it to Death's domain and finally finds his brother. But this dude is more pissed than he is. He blames Kratos for everything that has happened to him, which is mad unfair. Bro, we were both kids. You wanted me to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with not one, but two gods? My weapon was taller than me. How the hell was that going to happen? But Deimos doesn't care. He attacks and beasts the living shit out of Kratos. However, before their battle continues, Thanatos, the primordial god of death, pulls up and snatches his brother. A weakened Kratos chases after them, then saves his brother. With that, Deimos lets go of his hate for him, then the two team up and confront Thanatos. The god of death laughs about how Ares and Athena took the wrong marked warrior on that fateful day. Then, the brothers go to town on him. Sadly though, Deimos dies during the fight. With the only piece of his known family gone, Kratos lets all the rage he's built up consume him. He goes off on the god of death until he ultimately kills him. He then leaves his brother in a nearby grave dug up by Gravedigger Zeus, who tells him that he is now death, the destroyer of worlds. The foreshadowing go crazy. Afterwards, he's met by Athena, who tells him he is now ready to become a full god. Which begs the question, what about everything before this? Killing his own family didn't make him worthy? Stopping Ares' plot to take over Olympus didn't make him worthy? How much more will you take from this man, bro? Hearing Athena say this pisses the ghost of Sparta off even more. He pushes Athena away and leaves saying he'll get his revenge. Now it's time for a little filler arc. There was this game within the God of War series called God of War Betrayal. It was a mobile game that didn't really cover much, but it's still canon so we gotta talk about it. Also, while doing research, I saw some sources say that Betrayal takes place after Ghost of Sparta. However, there were also a bunch of sources saying the opposite. Personally, I feel like Betrayal makes the most sense taking place after the Ghost of Sparta. The game involves him warring with pretty much all of Greece, and this perfectly leads up to what happens in the next game in the timeline, God of War 2. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Anyway, like I said, Kratos rages war on all of Greece out of anger for how the gods treated him. At first, Zeus ignores his rampage, but eventually it worries him. He sends Hermes' son, Serix, to talk to him and stop all this, but Kratos ends up killing him. Kratos' army rejoices from the wind, but the ghost of Sparta knows Zeus is most likely going to come after his ass for all the violence he caused. Little did he know that it'd be sooner than he thought. To kick off the next chapter of the God of War lore, we move to God of War 2. Kratos' war with Greece is still going, with the city of Rhodes being his next target. His army is already down there causing havoc, but now he's on his way to aid them. Athena tries to stop him, but Kratos pushes her away yet again. 
That's what you get for being a manipulative bitch. He appears as a giant in front of his enemies, but out of nowhere, an eagle flies in and absorbs a good amount of his godly powers. It then gives it to a giant statue known as the Colossus of Rhodes, which gives it life. But even as a regular-sized mortal, or rather demigod, Kratos is still not about the games. He continues fighting the giant. But this new enemy refuses to falter. So Zeus gives Kratos a helping hand in the form of the Blade of Olympus, the same weapon used to end the Titan War. Kratos reluctantly takes it, dumps all the god energy he has left in it, and uses it to defeat the Colossus. However, the battle leaves Kratos badly wounded. He tries to get the sword back, but the eagle returns only to reveal itself as Zeus. Kratos is like, why did you betray me? And Zeus is like, betray you? You're the one out here breaking shit because you're mad at us. This ends now. With that, Zeus uses the sword to stab Kratos in his stomach. Then he eviscerates all the Spartans in the area. As he breathes his last breath, Kratos swears it'll get his revenge. Then Zeus leaves as he's dragged into the underworld. But before his soul's demise, he's saved by the primordial Gaia of all people. She admits that she's been watching Kratos this whole time. However, she can watch no longer. She, along with some of the Titans who fell at the hands of the gods, will help Kratos defeat Zeus. What Kratos needs to do is wake the hell up and find the Sisters of Fate. With their power, he can go back in time and defeat Zeus before he gets a jump on him. So our boy gets his stomach hole healed and climbs out the underworld once again. Using a Pegasus gets it to him by Gaia, he flies to the island of creation where the Sisters of Fate reside. Then after landing on the island, Kratos finally asks Gaia why she's helping him. I mean, she is the grandmother of Zeus after all. Gaia answers this question with a tale of how the Great Titan War started. Turns out she's pissed that she and the other Titans got shafted for what Kronos did. And now she has beef with Zeus because of it. With that information, he continues on his quest to find the Sisters of Fate. On his journey, he becomes allies with a bunch of fallen Titans, even Atlas, who hates his ass. And of course, his journey is also filled with people who want him gone. Even Auric comes back from the dead, with dreams of using the Sisters of Fate to go back in time and kill Kratos. But our boy ends that dream by killing him once again. After some time, Kratos runs into the last survivor of Sparta. From him, he finds out that Sparta is no more. Zeus went there and demolished the place. This gets Kratos even more aggravated. He's like, Zeus, you punk bitch! Stop hiding and fight me like the god you say you are! But it looks like that was a blow that was too much for Kratos to handle. He gives up on his mission out of frustration. However, a vision from Gaia inspires him to use the flames of his rage as a weapon. Now, even more determined, he continues his quest and decides to quite literally put fate in his own hands by killing each sister of fate one by one. Let me say that again. This man killed the sisters of fate. Do y'all understand how wild that is? The Sisters of Fate are primordials who control the fate of everything, even the gods and the titans. Yet Kratos was so done with the bullshit, he beat all of them by himself. And let's not forget how he also beat Thanatos, who also counts as a primordial. So this man Kratos is not only one of the angriest video game protagonists, but he's also one of the strongest. He may be the strongest character we ever covered in the series, and we covered Asura. Anyway, after the sisters die, Kratos goes back in time to when Zeus killed him and tackles him away from his past body. Zeus is like, damn, the sisters actually helped you? And Kratos is like, nah B, I killed them. With that, they come at each other, and after a long fought battle, Kratos proves that not even the king of the gods can take him. He gives him a taste of his own medicine by stabbing him in the stomach with the blade of Olympus. But before he gets a chance to finish him off, Athena rushes in trying to calm him down. Zeus attempts to use his chance to escape, but wastes time talking about how Kratos has started a war that he cannot win. Bro, this man is trying to kill you. Run! Kratos pushes past Athena and rushes at Zeus, but once again, Athena intervenes, and she gets stabbed instead. Now Zeus decides to leave. Guess he wants to see Athena get laid out beforehand. But Kratos was left distraught. Athena was pissing him off, sure, but she was the only god who was nice to him. Kinda. However, before Athena's death, she tells Kratos the reason why Zeus is such a big hate boner for him. Zeus was scared of the prophecy saying his Mark son will lead to his demise, and Kratos is that Mark son. So, this is all an attempt to end the cycle of patricide that he started by killing his father, Kronos. However, I call a huge cap on this, because none of this would have happened if Zeus just left his son alone. Before Ares and Athena pulled up to Sparta, Kratos didn't know anything about his father, and it probably would have stayed that way. The only reason Kratos is so eager to kill Zeus now is because Zeus drew first blood. You can't be mad when you're the one who started this shit. What makes it funnier is that Athena really tries to defend Zeus, saying, without him, there is no Olympus. And I get that, but Athena, your father's a dick. I'm sorry. If the main reason for saving Zeus is to preserve Mount Olympus, then maybe we don't need Mount Olympus anymore. And Kratos feels the same way. Homie's like, if all of Olympus will deny me my revenge, then all of Olympus will die. Spoken like the true godslayer he is. Now, with Athena dead, 
and Zeus gone to Mount Olympus to warn the other gods about his son, Kratos decides to form a new army for the upcoming war. Homie goes back in time and recruits the Titans from right before the Great Titan War. Then together, they climb up Mount Olympus, ready to put an end to the era of the gods. we made it to God of War 3, the game that ends the Greek arc of the story. Kratos and his Titan allies are climbing up Mount Olympus, and the gods are doing what they can to hold them off. But before we continue, I just want to give credit where credit is due. The beginning of the second Great Titan War is still one of the coolest events in gaming history. The cutscenes for this part look so crisp, and they still look good to this day. Plus, seeing all the gods lined up using their special abilities is so lit even if they're all assholes. Like, even if you've never touched God of War, I don't know how someone couldn't get hyped for this moment. Santa Monica truly went off. Anyway, the first got to catch Kratos' hands is Poseidon. He tries to hold Gaia and Kratos back by forming his own water titan, but that shit is child's play to our boy. With the help of Gaia, he knocks the god out of his titan and literally beats the life out of him. But y'all remember how killing a primordial made a new landscape? Well, for the gods, death means natural disasters. So Poseidon's death leads to the sea rising at an abnormal rate, flooding almost all of Greece. Kratos doesn't care though, so he and Gaia continue up Mount Olympus like nothing happens. They make it to the top, and now Zeus decides to get involved. He sends a lightning bolt at Gaia, severely wounding her and knocking Kratos off balance. The ghost of Sparta pleads for her to help him hold on, but she straight up admits that they don't need Kratos anymore. Just like the gods, the titans used him as a pawn. They just needed him to get their run back with the Olympians. So basically, if you're not mortal, you can't be trusted. With that, Kratos falls all the way down to the river Styx. That's right fam, Doom went to the underworld again. And guess who's here? Goddamn Athena. She states that her sacrifice put her in a higher plane of existence, and now she's actually down to help Kratos. To show that she means well, she upgrades Kratos' sword to the Blades of Exile. She follows up by telling him how to defeat Zeus. He must find and extinguish the Flame of Olympus, the source of Zeus's power. Once she leaves, Kratos begins trekking through the underworld. He runs into Pandora, who asks him to save her from the prison she's in, but the ghost of Sparta denies her request. Our boy's busy. He eventually runs into Hades, kills his ass causing all the souls of the underworld to go crazy, then uses the god's soul to re-enter the world of the living. And guess who he sees almost immediately? Bitch-ass Gaia. She's surprised that Kratos is still alive, but right now she's struggling to stay alive herself. So in desperation, she asks Kratos to help her. The fucking audacity, bro! Kratos gives her a hell no with his whole chest, then sinks it in by cutting off her hand. Next to catch the smoke is Helios. The sun god tries to hold his own against the ghost of Sparta, but just like the gods before him, he fails. I don't know what he thought was gonna happen. Kratos already beat the god of the underworld, the god of the sea, and death. What were you really gonna do, Helios? Didn't Kratos have to save your ass before all this? After beating the god, Kratos asks him about the flame of Olympus, but Helios refuses to tell. So Kratos rips his head off, which causes darkness to befall the land. With another god dead, Kratos continues his quest till he runs into Hermes, the messenger god. All Hermes does at first is talk shit, but Kratos ignores him calling him a fly from the ass of Zeus. The god continues to taunt Kratos, till our boy finds something familiar, Pandora's box, but it's covered by the flame of Olympus, which is lethal to the touch. Athena appears next to him, and tells him that he'll need this to defeat Zeus, but Kratos is confused as to why so Athena explains. She says that during the first Great Titan War, Zeus realized that all the evils released from the war, greed, fear, and hate, had the power to destroy the world. So he commissioned Hephaestus, the blacksmith of the gods, to build a box powerful enough to hold these evils. That was Pandora's box. Back when Kratos released his content to defeat Ares, he unleashed those same evils upon the world. This is why Zeus has been consumed by his fear of Kratos all this time. However, there's a stronger power within this box that hasn't been unleashed yet, and the only way to get to it is with Pandora's help. Hephaestus just so happens to be Pandora's father, so it looks like Kratos is gonna have to talk to him. Before that though, Hermes rears his annoying ass head again, so Kratos kills him and takes his legs for himself. Homie said, your speed is mine. For this god's natural disaster upon death, he releases a deadly plague on all the land, but once again, Kratos just kinda shrugs off the consequences of his actions. He continues his quest and runs into another god, Hera, wife of Zeus and goddess of marriage. But homegirl is drunk as shit, so she's not trying to fight, Instead, she sends Kratos' half-brother Hercules to kill him. And Hercules is hyped for the opportunity. He's been jealous of Kratos because he believes Zeus likes him best. Kratos' name is known across the land. Meanwhile, Hercules is stuck doing his labors. But bro, Zeus didn't do any of that shit. If Zeus wasn't trying to screw with Kratos all this time, the Ghost of Sparta probably wouldn't even be as famous. Facts! Poor Hercules is just dumb. So the two fight, 
and Kratos beats the mess out of his bro with his own gauntlets. Then Kratos keeps it pushing until he runs into Aphrodite, the goddess of love and wife of Hephaestus. Luckily for Kratos, she's one of the only gods who doesn't have beef with him, but she does want Kratos' beef, if you know what I mean. Kratos is apprehensive at first, but blowing off some steam never hurt anyone. So they do the devil's tango, and afterwards he leaves to meet with Hephaestus. Crazy how you just slept with his wife, and now you're looking for his help. Hey, Kratos didn't do shit. He was just obliging Aphrodite's request. I see nothing wrong with that. You're right, you're right. So Kratos tells Hephaestus the situation he's in, but the smith god is not trying to help. Currently, Pandora is being imprisoned in a complex labyrinth and he blames it on Kratos. See, back when Hephaestus created the box, the key created to open it gained sentience. That key was Pandora. And since then, he's seen her as his daughter. However, after Kratos used the box to defeat Ares, Zeus's fear overcame him. So he tortured Hephaestus to tell him about the key. Once the smith god revealed the truth, Zeus commissioned the architect, Daedalus, to construct the labyrinth meant to hold her. And to keep the box away from her, he sealed it within the flame of Olympus. However, even after hearing the story, Kratos is still adamant about getting Pandora. So Hephaestus, realizing the only way to stop Kratos is by sending him on an impossible mission, changes his mind. He tells Kratos to go to the depths of Tartarus to find the Omphalo Stone. With that, the smith god can make him a special weapon to make his mission easier. Unaware of the god's trickery, Kratos follows his instructions and runs into the old titan, Kronos. The titan tries to kill Kratos by eating him, but our boy pulls through by cutting his way out of Kronos' stomach. And the best part is that the stone he was looking for was in the titan's stomach this whole time. That's a big ass W. Once Kratos returns to Hephaestus, he almost bodies him for trying to throw him into a trap. But the god makes it up to him by forging the nemesis wings for him. Then he immediately screws it up for himself by betraying him. When will these gods ever learn that you shouldn't mess with Kratos? Homie is rage incarnate! So the ghost of Sparta ends up having to kill him anyway. Following his death, Kratos leaves the underworld once again, only to be met by an even more drunk Hera. She rants about how Kratos is destroying the earth, but our boy doesn't give a fuck so he ignores her. Until she calls Pandora a whore, which hits Kratos in a place he didn't expect. To defend her honor, he snaps Hera's neck, thus adding another god to his kill streak. With her death, all plant life on the planet dies. Now Kratos doesn't have much standing in his way. He heads to the labyrinth and finally frees Pandora. As they escape, Pandora talks to Kratos about how Zeus savaged her and her father. But as he and the other gods tortured her, she heard the fear in their voices whenever Kratos was brought up. That fear they had gave her hope that one day Kratos would put an end to the tyranny of Olympus. Kratos doesn't believe in hope though, because he's Kratos. But the conversation they share in the labyrinth draws him closer to her. She reminds him of his daughter. Their bond develops so much that when they get to Pandora's box, he stops Pandora from unlocking it because doing so requires her to sacrifice her life. But Pandora argues that this is what she was made to do. So she runs to the box, but bumps right into Zeus. And the god daddy is not happy. He grabs her and starts berating Kratos about this huge mess he made. But Kratos only cares about him putting down Pandora. So Zeus obliges by throwing her ass away. Shouldn't have done that, bro. Now Kratos is 1000% done. So he and his father go to war once again. But in the process, Pandora sacrifices herself to open the box. After the dust clears, Kratos checks in the box, only to see that it's empty. Well, that sucks. Zeus peeps and starts laughing at our boy, bro. So Kratos goes back to giving him the business. Gaius is up mid-fight, angry that Kratos has caused so much damage to the world. Her world. So Kratos moves the fight inside of Gaia and kills both her and Zeus by putting the Blade of Olympus through him and her heart. But when Gaia falls, the spirit of Zeus attacks Kratos. Bro, can you just stay dead? The god spirit overpowers him and traps him in a nightmarish world where he's forced to watch all the screwed up shit he did. But Pandora comes in clutch, but not only guiding him, but helping him forgive himself for his past sins. With that, Kratos busts out of this dark world and fights off Zeus with the new power he had locked inside all along, Hope. See, back when he opened the box the first time in God of War, Hope was released and went into him, but it was underneath all the self-hatred and anger he had. Forgiving himself gave room for the power of Hope to finally shine. This returns his god powers to him as well. Then, in one of the most violent scenes in gaming history, Kratos beats the ever-loving, lightning-spewing, tyrannical shit out of his father. You'll love to see it. With that, Zeus finally dies, sealing this world's fate as it plunges into chaos. Athena shows up asking Kratos to give the power of hope to her. She wants to use it to save the world and rule it the way she sees fit. But Kratos is overcome by a new grief. Now that he's gotten his revenge, he finally realizes what it costs to get it. The world is dying, his family is dead, and the new friend he just met sacrificed herself only for this to happen. So he ignores Athena and attempts to unalive himself by plunging the Blade of Olympus into his body. This releases the hope he was granted into the world, which leaves Athena disappointed. She takes the blade and leaves him there to die. However, this isn't the end for the ghost of Sparta. The world may be dying, 
but for Kratos, this is only a turning point. Now this is the part where we'd go into the newer God of War games. But since my last time covering this story, we've gotten not one, but two comics covering Kratos' transfer from the Greek world to the Norse world. To start, we have God of War Fallen God, published by Dark Horse Comics. This story begins right after the end of God of War 3. Though he tried to off himself using the Blade of Olympus, Kratos is still alive and pissed. He realizes now that because of everything he did, he's cursed to walk this earth forever. Out of anger, he tries his best to abandon the Blades of Chaos, the one weapon he has left that ties him to his past. But no matter how many times he throws them away, they continue to follow him. He does this for years while traveling away from the chaos he left back in the Greek world. Eventually, he comes across a village he's never seen before, with actual inhabitants. However, the people living here are terrified of him, and Kratos has no idea why. A mysterious old man confronts him, referring to him as the Ghost of Sparta, meaning this guy is aware of Kratos' past. He goes on to tell him that these people may fear him now, but that's because they are unaware of the destiny he has here in the land of the pharaohs. So this not only confirms that Kratos somehow found his way to Egypt, but it looks like he unknowingly traveled in between realms. Sounds crazy, but Kratos is a god after all. Anyway, Kratos isn't trying to hear anything the old man is talking about. He pushes him away and continues his aimless travels. As the months go on, he keeps getting told about how destiny has brought him here for a reason. And he keeps trying to get rid of his blades even though they refuse to leave him. Sometime later, he collapses from exhaustion, only to find Athena in his dreams. She starts telling him that he needs to come home and embrace his destiny, but Kratos isn't trying to hear her shit either. However, when he wakes up from his dream, he comes to terms with the fact that this is his own personal hell. He still doesn't fuck with them blades though, so he tries chucking them shits again. After more drifting, he returns to the same village he pulled up to after leaving the Greek world. But now, the villagers are happy to see him, because they're being attacked by this big ass thing they call a chaos beast. The same old man from before appears and is like, well would you look at that? Seems like destiny brought you to us right when we needed you. I told you it would, but this only angers the ghost of Sparta more. He pushes all the villagers away saying, fuck this destiny nonsense, I do what I want. No destiny is going to control my actions. In response, old man Kun is like, so what, you're just gonna leave these villagers to die? That's pretty messed up, fam. Kratos tries to tell him that he just wants to be left alone, but when he points at him to yell some more, the old man is gone. The only beings left in this village are him and the Chaos Beast. At first, our boy tells the thing to shoe, but of course it doesn't listen to him. So Kratos succumbs to his rage and decides to square up with the beast with just his fists. After an arduous battle, Kratos beats the thing, but the villagers still look afraid. The old man then returns to tell him that that was only an appetizer. The real battle he was called to handle is about to begin. Then as if on cue, a hippo kaiju appears ready for the smoke. At this point, Kratos is back to wanting nothing to do with all this. But when the hippo shows that it wants him, Kratos attacks it. But after his attempt, he realizes his bare hands won't do enough damage. The hippo uses this moment to strike back, knocking Kratos unconscious. He returns to the dream realm he was in before, but this time he's confronted by Athena and the old man, who is revealed to be the Egyptian god, Thoth. Both the deities tell him that as much as he may try, he can never run away from his destiny. Then they point to his Blades of Chaos, and Kratos just gives up. He curses everything, including himself, then finally takes the Blades, signifying acceptance of his destiny. With them, he manages to slay the beast, but in an extremely morbid ending. He curls up into fetal position, frustrated with the fact that he feels imprisoned by his past actions and emotions. Then he leaves, to continue his directionless adventure. Eventually, he makes it to Midgard, one of the nine realms in Norse mythology. Then after years of staying secluded, he meets a woman named Faye. They find friendship through battle. Later, that friendship turns into love, and they end up having a kid named Atreus, which brings us to the next and last comic in the timeline, God of War. Yeah, the title is just God of War, no subtitle or anything. Anyway, Faye takes it upon herself to pretty much raise Atreus on her own. She teaches him how to read the Nordic language, how to hunt, and more. However, due to him always being sick, he's limited in what he can do. Kratos still hangs around them, but he spends most of his time testing himself by controlling his rage in front of anything that tries to attack him. If he acts out and kills his aggressor, then he counts it as a failure. The man even has his own mantra, I control my rage, it does not control me. But because of these excursions, Kratos' relationship with his son is pretty weak, and it doesn't help that he lashes out whenever he comes home after a failure. One day, while on one of these tests, he runs into an old man getting attacked by a bear. Because he never took the time to learn the Nordic language, Kratos has no idea what the guy is trying to say. Regardless, just the sight of the scuffle swells his rage. In no time, he jumps at the bear, kills it, then leaves damning both the bear and the old man to hell. Damn, Kratos. 
Last I checked, old boy didn't do shit to you, but okay. Later that day, he heads back home to find Atreus playing with his toys instead of doing his chores. Kratos would scold him, but intruders show up at his crib before he can. They start yelling at him in that Nordic tongue, but luckily, Atreus can understand them. He says they're mad at Kratos for killing one of their brothers. Then all the intruders morph into bears and attack the two of them. Kratos manages to dispatch them, but the leader of the intruders dips saying he'll return with the whole clan. This infuriates Kratos. Y'all gonna invade my home, then run away like cowards? What kind of pussy shit is that? But he quickly calms himself and takes Atreus to go looking for the clan before they get the jump on them. His son mentions a seer who lives nearby. In Norse mythology, a seer is pretty similar to an oracle. They were shamans who had the ability to see into the future. Apparently, they were so powerful that even Odin, the king of the Norse gods, used their abilities for his benefit. Atreus tells his father that the seer can direct them to their enemies, and Kratos is down to meet her. He even calls it a good idea, giving Atreus some much-needed positive affirmation. And you could tell Homeboy needed it too, because after that, he leads the way with the biggest smile on his face. Homie was like, oh shit, my dad actually likes me. Once they get to the seer's hut, she instantly shows her skills by speaking in the same language as Kratos and correctly identifying who he is, the Greek God Slayer. She goes on to tell the two that their aggressors are known as the Berserkers, savage men who gain power from the beer god by worshipping a totem in their name. Their transformation is fueled by their fury. This makes him think about his own actions in the past and how they were stimulated by his attack first mentality. He wants to be better. After hearing the seer out, he concludes that taking out the totem the Berserkers praise is the best way to end this. He tells Atreus to stay here for his safety, then he journeys to the Berserker hideout. Once he gets there, he starts off well. Instead of going all aggro, he tries to sneak in. But unfortunately, one of the Berserkers catch him and wakes everyone up so they can jump him. Sadly, Kratos lets his rage consume him and goes off on the bears. But during his rage, he remembers something the seer told him before he left. If you fight the monsters on your own terms, you are sure to lose. You must fight them as a man yourself, one capable of reason and wisdom. With that, our boy quells his anger and throws his axe at the totem, destroying it. The Berserkers then morph back into their regular selves. But Kratos' rage overcomes him again, and he ends up killing the whole clan anyway, so that little growth moment amounted to nothing. Meanwhile, back at the Seer's place, she hands Atreus a dagger while telling him to remember this moment. Soon he will become stronger than he knows. Of course, this message confuses the hell out of Atreus, but before he can ask anything, one of the Berserkers pulls up for blood. Kratos returns some time later and panics after hearing a scream come from the Seer's place. He runs into the house to see the Seer dying on the floor, and Atreus defending her from the Berserker. Kratos tells his son to dip, then the Berserker lunges at him, screaming in Nordic. Kratos is like, For the last time, I don't know what you're saying! This snaps his neck. So much for keeping his rage in check. After the last Berserker's death, Kratos and Atreus bury the dead seer. Then together they head back home to reunite with Faye. Unfortunately though, Faye dies due to unknown reason sometime after this. Which finally brings us to God of War 4. Or just God of War. But before we get into that lore, I want to first take some time talking about how this game came to be. I was originally just going to go into the lore, but then I watched the Raising Kratos documentary, detailing the development story of God of War. And that shit got me so emotional and so inspired. But please, this little summary I'm about to give you does not give the doc justice. If you're a God of War fan or just a gaming fan in general, please do yourself the service of watching the doc yourself. It is beyond good. Anyway, after God of War Ascension's release in 2013, it became clear to Santa Monica that people were bored of Kratos. Some even wanted them to kill him off if they were going to make a new God of War game. So, Santa Monica first decided to start working on a new IP, dubbed Internal 7, but that ended up not working out so the project got cancelled. Then everything changed once the GOAT, Cory Barlog, rejoined Santa Monica. For those who don't know Cory, he's a big contributor to the God of War franchise. His most notable work was as director and writer for God of War 2. With him, they decided to stick to what works and just make a new God of War title. But this one had to be different. It was going to be a reboot that brought Kratos into a new light. And thanks to Cory, he wasn't going to return as the same anti-hero we watched demolish the Greek pantheon. See, Cory didn't just come back to Santa Monica. He came back as a father. Therefore, his whole perspective on life changed. He thought this new perspective would be great for Kratos. Like, you have this guy who's done with living and has nothing, but now he has a son who he has to care for himself. And though he doesn't feel prepared to take on the job of a father, his son Atreus teaches him how through their journey. And Cory was big on this being an integral part of the story. Technically, we already saw Kratos as a father, but that was only for the backstory. Now he would see Kratos relearning how to be human in real time. Or rather, just learning how to be a human. Because when did this man ever get the chance to do that? Even when he was chilling with Lysandra and Calliope, he was fighting 24-7. 
Anyway, once their core idea was set, everything else started coming together. Originally, the game was going to be based on Egyptian mythology, but they changed it to Norse. To breathe more life into the game, the actors behind the characters didn't only voice them, but also did motion capture for them. Funnily enough, this baffled the actors because it felt like they were working on a cinematic piece. Compared to other titles, especially previous God of War titles, this project was heavily story focused. So this was like making a movie that you could play. During the doc, some of the actors like Christopher Judge and Daniel Basuti spoke about how close to home the subjects tackle in the game were. They even got emotional on set because of how much they related to the characters they played. And that emotion definitely made the performances so much better. After years of non-stop work from Santa Monica, God of War finally released in 2018. It received a total of 40 perfect scores, and in just three months, it became one of the fastest selling exclusives in PlayStation history. Crazy too, because there were so many problems during the development process. But thanks to the teamwork of the whole Santa Monica fam, they managed to come out with a banger. And before we walk away from this development story, quick shout out to my boy Ignit Rizzi. There was a scene in the doc where they showed a bunch of creators his first reaction to the God of War trailer, and he was in there, twice. So send your boy some love. He makes really dope fighting game content and reacts to news in the FGC as well. But with that being said, on to the lore. God of War begins with Kratos and Atreus holding a funeral for Faye. Before her death, she asks her loved ones to spread her ashes over the highest point of the Nine Realms. Kratos wants to fulfill her wish, but getting to where they need to go is about to be rough. He can handle that, but Atreus, maybe not. So they go on a hunt together as a test. With his father's guidance, Atreus manages to hunt down a wild deer, but he struggles with the killing part. They almost share a nice father-son bonding moment afterwards, but a troll interrupts them looking for a fight. Kratos gives it the business using his trusty new Leviathan axe, but after the fight, Atreus starts tweaking yelling at the troll like, You ain't shit, bitch! Don't let me ever find you in this neck of the woods again! But he starts coughing aggressively as he wilds out. Kratos grabs him to calm him down, but breaks the poor kid's heart when he tells him that he's not ready for their quest. Atreus is pissed by this, of course, and I get it, but if this is how you get after one troll fight, I don't know if you should be going on dangerous adventures either. With that, they head back home but they get attacked by more beasts in the way. And both Kratos and Atreus are very confused about this. They used to be pretty safe in their shack in the middle of the woods. Once home, Kratos collects the ashes of Faye, then continues arguing with his son. Atreus is like, I'm not sick anymore, I'm ready. And Kratos is like, boy, shut your stupid ass up. Keep wilding out and you're gonna get us both killed. Suddenly, the shaking of their house disrupts them. Immediately afterwards, Kratos hears someone banging on their door. Well, that's sus. He tells Atreus to hide, then opens the door to find some Conor McGregor lookalike he's never seen before. Homie instantly starts talking smack, but what's odd is that what he's saying shows that he knows that Kratos is not from here. When our boy tries to show him away, the dude is like, and here I thought your kind was supposed to be enlightened. Your kind? Oh yeah, this dude definitely knows Kratos was a god. Regardless, Kratos tries to keep his cool. He should have tells the guy he does not want this work, but the guy attacks him anyway. So Kratos lets his rage go and they go at it, fam. And I know we just finished praising the game, but I'm sorry, we gotta do it again. Because this fight is so fucking cool. It's like watching two DC heroes go at it, but it's so raw. According to Denny Ye, the senior staff combat designer at Santa Monica, the team wanted the player to feel like a god fighting another god. And Jesus, they deliver. Before I die, I would love to direct a scene like this. But that's enough flattery for now. The fight rages on, but oddly enough, the stranger doesn't feel any of the pain being dealt by Kratos, and Kratos is going in, bro. So with no choice left, Kratos is forced to snap homie's neck. He walks back home, weakened and distraught about this whole debacle. Who the hell was that? Why are mad people attacking him on the day of his wife's funeral? These thoughts push him to take Atreus and leave their home to fulfill Faye's wishes, regardless of the boy being ready or not. As they leave the safety of their territory, they notice that the shield protecting them has a break in it. Apparently, Faye's touch protected them from some of the many dangers of this world including the gods. But now that she's gone, her protection is no longer here either. And Kratos literally has the presence of a god. So without Faye, home is like a big ass thought on an empty sheet of paper. Their journey eventually brings him to a dwarf named Brock. He and his brother are responsible for making Kratos' new Leviathan axe. After a quick introduction, he pretty much agrees to be Kratos' personal blacksmith. Later, they find a boar, Kratos uses this as a moment to further train his son with hunting, and it actually goes well. The part I love about it is that Kratos actually lets him take the lead. He leaves him to figure out why the boar's hide is too strong, and seeing that is way better than watching him explain everything to Atreus. That's solid parenting right there. But this happy moment gets cut short right after the boy manages to get the boar. They run into this mysterious woman named Freya, who claims the boar is her friend. These guys are to kill her friend. They apologize, then help her heal the boar back at her place. But when she sends Atreus to get some materials for her healing spell, she pulls Kratos aside and is like, I know you're a god. 
Yo, who doesn't know Kratos is a god at this point? She warns him about how the Norse gods don't take kindly to outsiders, especially Odin, who's known for letting his paranoia get to him. More on that later though. But what's most bothersome to her is that Atreus is completely unaware of his godly heritage. If Kratos doesn't tell him, then it could mean trouble for the both of them, especially Atreus. As you probably guessed, Kratos doesn't take any of this well, and is like, Bitch, you better mind your goddamn business, which she does. After the healing is done, she helps them with their quest by masking their presence from the gods. Then, she puts them to a portal out of here and wishes them luck as they leave. They travel to the Lake of Nine, meet the World Serpent, then they meet Sindri, Brock's way more nervous brother. Just like Brock, he recognizes the axe, but he gives more history on it. They originally made it for Faye because she was always about protecting those who couldn't protect themselves. They thought this would be a way to help someone good do more good. Also, fun fact, it was fused with, and I quote, the echoing screams of 20 frost trolls. The more you know. But since Kratos and Atreus are a part of Faye's family, Sindri agrees to help them with weapon upgrades too. With that, their journey continues, then abruptly stops again when they run into this dark fog blocking their path. Freya returns out of nowhere and tells them that this is the Black Breath, a form of corrupt magic that can be dispersed by the light of Alfheim. But they don't have that, so next stop is Alfheim. Freya guides them to a mechanism capable of transporting them to different realms. With it, they continue to Alfheim, but something isn't right. Freya knows that the light is barely visible, then a moment later she's dragged out the realm. Strange, but Kratos and Atreus keep it pushing. A bunch of fights later, they make it to the light. Before Freya got yoked out of Alfheim, she told Kratos he needs to walk into it. Doing so brings him into this weird-ass dream world where he hears how Atreus truly feels about him. The boy talks about how his father never tries to understand him and heavily underestimates him. He even goes as far as to say that Kratos should have died instead of his mother, but he takes it all back hoping that one day he and his father can form an understanding. Then suddenly, Kratos is dragged out by Atreus. He questions why his son did this, but once he looks around, he peeps that even though it only felt like moments, he's been gone for a minute. And Atreus is pissed about this. With that, they leave. But Atreus continues to throw passive-aggressive comments, until he tries to say Kratos doesn't truly care about Faye. In response, the ghost of Sparta is like, Boy, one of us needs to stay focused. You grieve your way and I grieve mine. But Kratos realizes how hard this must be in Atreus, since they've never really been together like this before Faye's death. So he shares a bit of what he went through in that illusion world to ease his son's mind. Afterwards, they travel back to where they first encountered the Black Breath. They use the light of Alfheim to get through, and finally get back on track with their goal. They continue their climb up the mountain, then halt once they spot the same stranger who attacked them at their house. He's with two other dudes and they're asking a tree about Kratos. Through their eavesdropping, they find out that the stranger's name is Baldur, and he's one of Odin's sons. That can't be good. Once the trio leaves, Kratos and Atreus confront the tree. Turns out it's actually a man stuck in a tree. Kratos gives Atreus some random task to do so they can speak in private. He's pretty sure this guy knows about his godhood. The man reveals himself to be Mimir, the smartest man alive. He's been trapped in this tree thanks to Odin for over 100 years. The Ghost of Sparta tests his knowledge by asking why Baldur is after them, but Mimir is unsure at the moment. They need time to piece it together. Once Atreus returns, the next question they ask is where the highest point in all the realms is. They thought they knew where they were going, but the journey so far has shown them that they don't know shit about what they're getting into. Mimir tells them that the highest peak is in Jotunheim, the realm of the giants. But this confuses Kratos and Atreus, because the giants as well as the realm tower for Jotunheim disappeared a long time ago. See, back in the day, Odin and the giants were at each other's throats. Giants held many secrets that Odin wanted, and he wanted them so badly that he's willing to kill every giant to get them. So, they disappeared along with their realm tower. Now it's near impossible to get to Jotunheim. Fortunately for the duo, Mimir knows a way. He can guide them, but first needs to cut off his head. Then they need to find Freya and ask her to reanimate him. Atreus isn't down to see all that, so he walks away. While he's gone, Mimir gives Kratos the same warning Freya did about hiding his godhood from Atreus. The longer he waits, the more his son will resent him once he does tell him. But you know Kratos. He takes the advice with a grain of salt, chops off Mimir's head, then they make their way back to Freya. Atreus gives her the warmest welcome ever when they get to her, but homegirl starts freaking out when she spots these arrows that was gifted to him by Sindri a while ago. She calls them dangerous, throws them in her fire, and screams at Atreus to promise never to use them. Well, that's sus. Fortunately, she replaces the arrow she destroyed with some of her own. After that awkward situation, they present her with Mimir's head. She doesn't like the idea of reviving him, but she does so to help her new friends out. But after his revival, Mimir accidentally blurts out that Freya used to be one of the Vaynir gods and wife to Odin. See, the Norse gods are split into two factions, the Aesir and the Vanir. A long time ago, these tribes were at war, but they ultimately grew sick of the constant violence. So Mimir, before Odin savaged him, suggested that the two tribes make peace by having Odin, the king of the Aesir, marry Freya, one of the Vanir leaders. Things worked out at first, but Odin's paranoia of his new wife caused Freya to leave him. 
so the tribes broke out into war again. But this time, Freya wasn't able to help because Odin banished her to Midgard. That explains why she got forced out of Alfheim when she went there with Kratos and his son. So Freya's not a fan of Amir, and Kratos is definitely not a fan of Freya now that he knows she's a god. He comes at her like, why didn't you tell me? And Freya snaps back like, are you really coming at me for keeping secrets? With that, Kratos walks out with Mimir pissed and doesn't tell Atreus why. The next stop, the Lake of Nine, to talk with the World Serpent. The Serpent is a giant, so he should know how to get to Jotunheim. They return to him, and Mimir speaks to him using an ancient language that is now dead. He tells them to get to Jotunheim, they need Thalmor's chisel. Then they need to learn and carve something known as a black rune into a special gateway. The first thing they go after is a chisel, but when they make it there, they're stopped by Thor's sons, Modi and Magni. Kratos and Atreus are forced to fight the two. They hold their own at first, but some disrespectful comments about fame made by Modi gets Atreus riled up. Kratos peeps that his son is about to act reckless, so he kills Magni, thus scaring Modi away. But due to Atreus' rage, his sickness starts picking back up. The boy toughs it out, but both Kratos and Mimir are worried for him. Nevertheless, they grab the chisel and dip to find the Black Rune of Jotunheim, and the Norse god of war, Tears Vault. But of course, something gets in their way when they get to the vault. This time it's Modi again. He pins Kratos down with lightning and continues talking shit about Faye. My man, didn't you learn a second ago that that's a bad idea? Kratos is unable to do anything, but Atreus lets his rage take over again and knocks himself out. Then Kratos loses it and punches the shit out of Modi. The pussy ass demigod runs away again, but Atreus ain't looking too hot. With haste, Kratos grabs Atreus and heads back to Freya so she can hopefully heal him. However, when they return, Freya tells him the only way to save him is for Kratos to go to Helheim, basically this mythology's underworld, and take the heart of the Keeper of the Bridge of the Damned. But this isn't some simple task that Kratos can just punch his way through. His axe can't do shit there. Freya tells him he'll need something else, and Kratos knows exactly what it is. A relic from his past that he kept hidden for centuries. The Blades of Chaos. You know this man loves his son to death if he's about to get the same weapons he tried throwing away for years. Freya reassures him that he's doing the right thing then Kratos prepares to leave. But before he does, Homie actually apologizes to Freya for getting pissed that she's a god. Look at our boy growing up. Now, without his son, he heads back home. And you can tell Kratos is not looking forward to digging up his past. Once he makes it there, he pulls out the Blades of Chaos from the spot he hid them in years ago. Then he's welcomed by a vision of Athena. She tries to deter his host by telling him no matter how much he tries, he'll never change. He'll always be a monster. But Kratos accepts it and leaves her saying that he is no longer her monster. Let her know, Kratos. Fuck Athena. Afterwards, he tests out the blades, then makes his way to Helheim. He kills the Keeper, takes his heart, then after dealing with the Zeus illusion, he leaves the realm. And during the adventure through Hell, he tells Mimir all the details about how he ended the Greek pantheon. Mimir uses all this info to further persuade Kratos to tell Atreus about all this, but Kratos refuses again. Back at Freya's place, they manage to heal Atreus, but the boy overheard Kratos and Freya talking about the whole god situation. So on their way back to Tyr's vault, Kratos tells him the truth. He tells him everything. Well, everything except for the fact that he killed the Greek gods, but he'll get to that. Surprisingly, Atreus takes it pretty well and even asks what kind of powers he might have. And he could tell just talking about this did wonders for Kratos because he becomes a little more chill. He even cracks a joke while they're in the vault. A skin dude from my homeland. Used to have one of Owen back in the day. You should take it, boy. Yes, boy, take it. We might need to butter bread somewhere in our travels. This is why no one likes you. But sadly, Jokey Joe Kratos goes away once he finds pottery showing his past escapades in the Greek world. Hate to see it. Anyway, after passing a bunch of trials and almost dying, they make it to the Black Rune. However, in the process they lose Freya's marking hiding them from the Norse gods. While in front of the rune, Kratos gives an award-winning motivational speech to his son. He gives him a dagger that he made out of Norse metal and Greek metal and tells him the importance of being a god. Then the father-son bonding continues as they leave Tyr's vault. They share a drink of wine to celebrate nearing the end of their journey. But sadly, this happiness doesn't last. Don't forget the franchise we're talking about here. When they reunite with Sindri on the way back to the special gateway, Atreus starts going in on the dude. He comes to how all he talks about is the differences he shares with his brother, and ends the rant with, We're tired of hearing about little problems from little people. Boy just found out he's a god and now his ego's off the charts. Even Kratos is confused by this. Usually Atreus is a nice one that everyone likes. He asks the boy why he said all that and Atreus responds with, the truth is better than kindness. Kratos tells him that his mom wouldn't agree. Then this little shit is like, well she wasn't a god. So now that you're a god, you get to disrespect your mom? You know what? Maybe Kratos was on something when he was keeping the whole god thing a secret. Atreus really became a dick in like 0.2 seconds after hearing about it and it only gets worse. As they continue, he starts shit-talking Odin, knowing full well they're no longer being protected by Freya. He's like, yo, straight up, 
Screw Odin and his weak ass family. All the Norse assholes who came after us got their ass beat and it's gonna be no different for the Allfather. In fact, Odin can see me with the hands. Aight Atreus, you talking crazy now. Oh, you haven't seen the worst of it yet. They run into Modi again all bruised up because both Thor and Odin blamed him for the death of Magni. Atreus warns them that they'll continue where they left off, but then Modi throws another jab at Faye. This dumbass. So Atreus stabs him in the neck with the same knife his father gave him. The same knife Kratos used to start that heartfelt speech about being responsible gods and never losing control. So Kratos scolds him, but Atreus snaps back because since they're gods, he feels like they should be allowed to do anything they want. Kratos warns him there are consequences for killing a god, and Atreus asks how he knows, but the ghost of Sparta remains silent. Now the two are on worse terms than when they started this adventure. While bickering endlessly, they finally make it to the Jotunheim Gate. But Baldur pulls up for the hands immediately and starts giving Kratos the business. In the process, their only gate to Jotunheim breaks. Kratos tells his son to leave so he can handle this, but instead, Atreus rages out and shoots his own father to pin him down. Not the friendly fire on your fucking dad! He lunges at Baldur, but the guy counters and stabs him. Can't say the kid didn't deserve it. With that, he takes the boy and leaves, but Kratos follows them. They battle it out on the dragon until they get to the mechanism that teleports them to different realms. Kratos uses it to take them to Helheim, which separates him and his son from their pursuer. As they journey through the realm, Atreus finally realizes how much of a dick he's been. He spots different illusions showing what he did to Modi. He doesn't even recognize himself. They keep moving and find Baldur watching a scene play out from his past. It's revealed that Freya is his mother, and this invulnerability he has is a lot more powerful than we thought. He can't feel anything. He can't taste food. He can't feel the cold. Nothing. Sad thing is that this is all his mother's doing. She gave him this ability through a spell and he hates her for it. The scene he watches shows him getting ready to kill her, but he changes his mind at the last minute. They leave him be, but later run into another illusion. This one shows the fight between Kratos and Zeus back in God of War 3. Kratos stands in shock at the scene, but Atreus, now on his A-game, snaps Kratos out of it so they can leave. They enter another vault where they see a panel about Tyr. Mimir deduces that this must be a clue to get to another one of Tyr's vaults. They may still have a chance to get to Jotunheim. With this newfound knowledge, they return to Brock looking to make the key the clue spoke of. At first, Brock refuses, but Sinji pops in and the two brothers finally agree to work together by making this key. Once it's made, Kratos, Atreus, and Mimir manage to find the vault, and there they encounter the Unity Stone. Mimir realizes that this stone is what Tyr used to protect himself when traveling between realms, so they follow in Tyr's footsteps and use the stone to travel to the realm between realms. There, they finally find the Jotunheim Tower. The tower absorbs the stone, then once they return to Midgard, they see they can now travel to Jotunheim. Well, almost. They need one last thing, Mimir's other eye. My god, how many fetch quests are these guys gonna go on? As many as it takes. Anyway, they find out from Brock and Sindri that Mimir's other eye is in the World Serpent's mouth. So they head back to the Lake of Nine and retrieve the eye. But before they're able to leave, the serpent spits them out violently then falls unconscious. That's odd. Freya appears a little too soon afterwards, asking about her son, but Kratos and Atreus find this hella sus so they keep their distance from her. Then Baldur joins the party. Freya tries to apologize to her son, but Baldur's not having it. He starts walking up to her with full intentions of ending her, but Kratos holds him back stating that vengeance will get him nowhere. Yeah, Kratos knows all about that. However, Baldur doesn't care, so they square up again. As they fight, Freya tries to tell him to stop, but when they don't listen, she traps Kratos leaving Atreus alone to defend himself. Baldur uses the opening to give the child the meanest punch in the chest, but when he pulls back, he notices a spell which made him invulnerable disappearing. Yeah, so remember those arrows Freya said were dangerous? Well, before she burned them, Kratos used one to fix Atreus' quiver strap. Baldur punching him in the chest made the quiver puncture his hand, and it turns out this is his kryptonite. So aware of her son's vulnerability, Freya summons a titan and moves Kratos and Atreus away from Baldur. She continues trying to tell them that she can reason with him, but homegirl doesn't realize that Baldur wants absolutely nothing to do with her. The battle rages on, and even Atreus starts putting in work. Then to break the standstill, Atreus calls on the World Serpent to slap some sense into Freya. Everyone falls, but the moment Baldur lands, Kratos starts choking him out. It looks like he's about to kill him, but Atreus gives him the same words he gave him before he killed Modi. He's beaten. He's not a threat. With that, Kratos warns him to leave them and Freya alone. Then he lets him go. But Baldur is still frustrated. He tells his mother that he'll never forgive her. So Freya gives herself up saying that if killing her will really make him whole, then he can do as he pleases. He goes in for the kill, but Kratos grabs him just in time and snaps his neck. No more Baldur. Kratos tells her that it was the only way, but Freya doesn't give a fuck. She threatens to throw every single evil she can at them, then ends her rant by calling him a monster. Kratos responds with, Bitch, you don't know me. And Freya's like, But does her son know you? And this finally gets Kratos to tell his son the whole truth about how he made a deal with Ares, and how he killed many, 
including his father. The news of the tray is hard. He asks this is always how it's like being a god, but Kratos reassures him that it doesn't have to be. They will be the gods they want to be. After another top-tier father speech, Freya takes her son's corpse and leaves. Atreus, his father, and Mimir then make their way to Jotunheim. Finally! Jesus! Mimir asks to be left at the gate, so Kratos and Atreus can have some alone time. Then once in Jotunheim, Kratos takes off his bandages covering his scars from the Blades of Chaos, stating that he no longer has anything to hide. I truly love this scene because I feel like this is Kratos officially turning a new leaf. Not only is he freeing himself of the sins of his past, but his personality also changed a great deal throughout this journey. And the fact that we watch all the changes happen organically makes us feel even more rewarding. This is the moment where I feel like the God of War officially becomes a Dad of War. Anyway, as they continue investigating this new realm, they run into a set of panels detailing their journey. It's like the Giants knew how everything was going to go down. This precognition is the main reason why Odin wanted the Giants' secrets. They also find out that Faye was a Giant. Apparently, Baldur was looking for them this whole time because he was trying to track her down. On top of that, it's revealed that Atreus' original name was supposed to be Loki. In Norse mythology, Loki was a brother of Thor and god of mischief, so there might be a deeper connection between the Norse gods and him. After that discovery, they climb to the highest peak of Jotunheim and spread Faye's ashes. They share a final goodbye, then as they leave, Kratos tells Atreus where his current name came from. There was a soldier in the Spartan army named Atreus, who always wore a smile. He sacrificed himself for his fellow soldiers, but he was remembered for bringing positivity to the army. So Kratos saw it fit to name his son after him. Once out of Jotunheim, they grab a mirror and head back home to rest. However, the story is not over yet. It's time to cover the last chapter of this tale so far. Let's talk about God of War Ragnarok. It's been three years since Atreus and Kratos completed their Jotunheim journey. Atreus is now way stronger, and Kratos is just about the same. However, since Baldur's death, they've been stuck in Fimble Winter, a three-year-long brutal winter that is prophesied to mark the coming of Ragnarok. Ragnarok being the prophesied end of the world. The game begins with Kratos and Atreus heading back home after a hunt, but just like in the last game, the violence begins almost immediately. Freya attacks them on the way home. Guess she's still mad. Oh, beyond that. She basically throws the whole forest at them, and the whole time, Kratos and Atreus try their best not to kill her. On top of that, we find out this is just one of the many attempts she made on their lives in the last three years. Luckily, they make it back home before she's able to do any serious harm. There, we're introduced to one of Atreus' wolves, Fenrir. He has two other ones named Specky and Svana. Sadly though, Fenrir is on his last leg, so after saying a prayer, he lets Fenrir go in peace. But Kratos notices this weird light leave Fenrir once he dies. He'll find out what that was later. After Fenrir's passing, Kratos goes back to business as usual, and tells Atreus it's time for them to continue training. Bro, the child's pet wolf just died. Relax. This leads to one of their usual arguments, but Atreus ends it by asking if he can just bury Fenrir in peace. Kratos leaves his son B, then heads inside to tell Mimir about Fenrir's death. Glad to see the bodiless homie is still with them. With that, he heads to bed. But in his dreams, he relives a memory with Faye. The dream ends with her putting her god-protecting mark on him and telling him that time is running out, and there is much to do. Once he wakes up, he finds out from Mimir that Atreus is gone. God damn it, boy. Not only that, but the protection stave has been broken. He tracks Atreus down till he runs into this big-ass bear ready for blood. Kratos barely manages to beat it, but as he's about to kill it, it transforms into Atreus. The ghost of Sparta almost loses it as he checks to make sure his son is okay. Luckily, he's fine, but he has no memory of his transformation. Kratos concludes that Atreus transformed because of his emotions, similar to the Berserkers back in that God of War comic. He states that this is all the more reason to keep training. They have no idea how his god powers work and training can help him control it. But Atreus argues that they need to find someone who can give them answers. He doesn't need discipline, he needs a guide to his powers. They end up dropping the argument for now though so they can fix the protections, Dave. Once they finish, they head home to sleep. Guess they're not gonna talk about the bear thing yet? They probably should though. Shortly after, their rest is disturbed by Thor, son of Odin and god of thunder. Apparently that post credit scene in God of War, where he pulled up to Kratos' crib, was just a vision seen by Atreus. Now he's really here. But at first, the guy seems harmless. For one, he actually asked to come in, and even offers me. However, this is the God of Thunder, and Kratos did kill a bunch of his family in the last game, so he's still against letting him in. Talking is better than fighting, though, so Kratos allows him to enter to see what the hell he wants. The conversation starts off calm, and for a sec, it seems like Thor actually wants to talk. But then fucking Odin the Allfather himself comes knocking at the door. Now, when they kept mentioning Odin in the last game, I thought he was gonna be more like a menacing and older version of Thor. This Odin is not the one I expected, but he is so much better. 
By his demeanor and how he carries himself, you can tell he doesn't give a shit about anyone but himself. Like, Zeus was bad, but I feel like if push really came to shove, you could reason with him. Odin, on the other hand, looks like the kind of guy who'd kill you just for sneezing in his direction. Anyway, Odin basically tells him that he doesn't give a fuck about losing Modi or Magni. Hell, Thor doesn't even really care. They say it was self-defense, that the two demigods were useless anyway. Well, goddamn, Odin. However, the Balder situation is different. Balder was Odin's best tracker, so now Kratos has a blood debt to pay. So Odin proposes a deal that honestly doesn't sound bad at all. He discovered that Atreus had been looking more and more into Tyr for the last three years. That bothers him because he sees Tyr as a huge threat. See, back when Odin was beefing with the giants for their secrets, Tyr, having both giant's blood and Aesir blood in him, tried to make peace with the two parties. He attempted to bring Odin over to Jotunheim to orchestrate peace talks, but the giants knew Odin was only trying to use Tyr to get to their secrets. So, the Norse god of war betrayed his father to help the giants disappear. In retaliation, Odin murdered all the giants he could and had Tyr killed. So now that he knows Atreus is looking into him, he simply wants him to stop. The Allfather even throws in an extra bone and says he'll keep Freya away from them too if he complies. But even though the Tyr situation caught Kratos off guard, he denies the deal. With that, Odin simply walks out telling Thor to be quick. Then the God of Thunder and retired God of War go at it. And people, if you thought Baldur vs. Kratos was wild, this shit is next fucking level. The wildest part is when Thor knocks Kratos out, then revives the man for more hands. Thor's a different kind of dude, bro. He even continuously pushes Kratos to release the monster within. Once he does though, he delivers a devastating blow to Thor, and the God of Thunder seems pleased with this. However, in an odd turn of events, he declares that the blood debt has been paid, then leaves. Brock and Sinji show up after the battle, and together the three of them run home. Atreus is left alone with Odin who honestly feels way more dangerous than Thor. They need to save him. They return home quickly, and luckily Atreus is still here. Apparently, the dude left money to pay for the roof, and invited Atreus to Asgard. The fuck? He also no longer cares about Jotunheim or the Giants. On top of that, he's found his own way to avert Ragnarok. So that's good news, I guess. Kratos takes this in, but he's pissed that Atreus kept the fact that he was looking for Tyr a secret. To earn back his trust, his son begs him to show him what he found through his investigation. He thinks he might have found a way to beat both Odin and Thor. His father thinks for a sec, then agrees to follow. He grabs his armor, Blades of Chaos, and Mimir, then they head out. Atreus leads him to a vault he believes was only meant for giants to see. There, they watch the story of Skull and Hati, two giant wolves who in Norse mythology spend their time chasing the sun and the moon. When they catch them, it's set to signal the beginning of Ragnarok. However, while watching the story in the vault, they notice that the giants freed the wolves themselves and moved them to Vanaheim. But no one in the group is sure about when this all takes place, because the story ends with Tyr leading an army against Odin during Ragnarok. Ragnarok hasn't happened yet, so maybe this is a premonition of the future, and Tyr is still alive? The giants did have crazy precognition, so it makes sense. Kratos isn't convinced though, so Atreus shows them one last thing. It's a panel that hints at Tyr being in prison in Svartalheim, the realm of the dwarves. After some persuasion from Mimir, Kratos agrees to go there and the news gets Atreus mad hype. They run into Sindri afterwards, who it turns out was helping Atreus with his little Tyr investigation. Kratos isn't happy about this, but what's done is done. Sindri invites them back to him and Brock's safe haven between realms. This will serve as their HQ for now since Odin can't find them here. They talk about their tier plan, and Sindri recommends they talk to his cousin, Durlin. Apparently, Faye used to know him when she was trying to form a rebellion against Odin, something Kratos knew nothing about. So with the brother's help, they find a way to travel between realms since Odin shut that shit down, then head to Svartalfheim. Once in the realm, they travel to the city of Nita Valir, where they're met by scared dwarves and an emergency siren. Sindri explains that the dwarves are like this because of Odin. His grip on this realm is so strong that all outsiders are seen as threats, hence why Faye was trying to help them with the rebellion. Luckily, they end up finding a dwarf named Rabe, willing to direct them to Durlin. And fun fact, this guy is based on and voiced by the composer of God of War in this game, Bear McCreary. Anyway, with his help, they find Durlin, but after hearing that Faye is dead, he pretty much ignores their plea for help. Instead, he gives him a fine for traveling with a severed head. Yo, screw this guy! However, later they realize that the fine is actually a map to a mine, so Durlin was still pretty helpful. On their way to the mine, Kratos starts questioning Atreus more about his intentions. He feels like his son is trying to start a war with Odin and wants to recruit Tyr, which in essence is a good thing. However, Kratos knows all about waging war with the gods. It never leads to anything good. He continuously warns Atreus that this could be a bad idea, but the boy is dead set on doing what he feels is right. Neither of them is wrong, so whenever they debate, Mimir tries to act as a mediator. However, even he knows that war with Odin may be inevitable. Then, after running into a bunch of dead ends, they finally find Tyr. He actually is alive. But the Norse God of War is down bad. 
He assumes Kratos, Mimir, and Atreus are all part of an illusion from Odin. After a stern talking to from Kratos, though, he agrees to leave with them. They give him a status update about everything going on right now, and even Tyr questions if they saved them just to start a war. He threw away his God of War title to pursue a pacifist lifestyle, so they're looking to start the smoke, he won't be of much help. Because of this, he asks Atreus what they expect from him. The boy tells him that they're just looking for answers, so Tyr accepts their request for help, and they head back to their HQ before Odin's soldiers come looking for them. Back at Sindri's and Brock's place, Kratos confides in Mimir about Atreus' plan. He's down to follow his son, but he's worried about how adamant he is. The last thing he wants to see is him get hurt. From the outside, Atreus catches all of this, and for some reason decides the best play is to try to make up with Freya. You mean the god who tried to kill you in the beginning of the game? Atreus, are you dumb? Sindri spots him, and Atreus shares his plan. The dwarf thinks it's wild as fuck too, so he suggests they try talking to the world serpent first. Depending on what he says, they can decide on whether talking to Freya is a good idea or not. Atreus agrees, and for the first time heads out without his father. Once they find the world serpent, the little giant manages to speak with him in the language of the ancients. Homie really learned a lot in the past three years. But the serpent only responds with, Ironwood. The hell is that? Nobody knows. So annoyed, they head to Freya. And just like Sindri thought, when Atreus finds her, she almost kills him. But he saves his own skin by telling her about everything he and his father found out. He tells her about how Odin came looking for peace, about how he apparently found a way to avert Ragnarok, and how Tyr's alive. This new information definitely hits Freya hard. But regardless, she tells Atreus to leave and never return. So he heads back to Sindri with the bad news. Well, at least he didn't die. On their way back to HQ, all this secret keeping gets Sindri to reveal something he's been hiding for a minute. Apparently, before Atreus was born, Brock died. Sindri went to the Lake of Souls in Alfheim to steal his soul back, but he only got three of the four parts. Ever since then, the secret has been eating away at him. Atreus tells him that Brock deserves to know, as Sindri replies saying Kratos has a right to know what they're doing too. They end up dropping the subject once they make it home though. Over breakfast with the squad, they decide on their next destination, Alphon, to find the shrine of Groa, the Knowledge Keeper. Also, real quick, I don't know what it is, but there's something comforting about watching these guys eat the table like a family. You just never see everyone so relaxed at one time like this. Anyway, Kratos, Mimir, Atreus, and Tyr make it to Alfheim, and as they travel through the realm, they share stories about the history of the Dark Elves and Light Elves. Once they enter Groa's shrine, they watch the story of how she found out about Ragnarok. Originally, she was meditating to find her husband, but instead, she got a vision of the cataclysmic event. Odin asked her about the vision, but after hearing it, he killed her. Cause he's Odin. The prophecy then shows Ironwood, but Mimir states that it's a paradise that only a few giants believed in. Then, the shrine surprises them with more info. It turns out Groa lied about the Ragnarok prophecy. Ragnarok actually leads to the end of only Asgard, the realm of the Aesir gods. The prophecy shows that there will be a war, and a champion will unite the realms against Odin and defeat him. This gives Atreus all the hope, but Kratos and Mimir are still apprehensive about all this. As for Tyr, he's kinda pissed. He doesn't want to be a part of this war, yet the prophecy states that he will be. With many questions on their mind, they drop the topic for now, and Tyr heads back home while Kratos, Atreus, and Mimir go on a side quest. Now, I'm gonna be real, this quest is not important to the overall plot, but it's honestly really heartwarming, so bear with me. So, while the squad was traveling through Alfheim, Atreus heard the voice of an animal in pain. He's developed this ability to feel what other animals feel. When they were about to head back to HQ, Kratos is the only one who actually reminds his son about the animal, and proposes they find it. Now, this is pretty strange for Kratos. Atreus especially finds it off, so much so that he continuously asks his father why they're doing this, and Kratos just tells him that he's curious. Then, when they finally save the beast, Kratos admits that the main reason why he wants to do this is because he doesn't know how much time they have left, and he wants to enjoy every second he can with Atreus. Damn, not Kratos of all people getting me in my feels, bro. Anyway, back at home, Tyr alludes to Atreus being the champion of prophecy, and Kratos gets pissed off at the comment. This leads to Atreus asking what all this is for. Every time they learn more about Ragnarok and what they think they're supposed to do, they end up with more questions than answers. In an outburst, Kratos shuts everything down by reminding Atreus that he is his son. Not some champion, not Loki, his son. And he wants him to be safe. Atreus doesn't take the scolding well, so he heads to his room pissed and sleeps it off. In his dreams, he enters a sandy area similar to the ones in the shrines they entered. After seeing glimpses of his past when he was letting the hubris of his godhood get the better of him, he teleported to a forest. He's greeted by a wolf who leads him to this young woman named Angerboda. Oddly enough, she says she's been waiting for this moment her whole life. She's also using paint that she says comes from the bark of the ironwood trees, meaning Atreus somehow dreamt his way into ironwood. 
She tells him to follow her, and what's even stranger is that she refers to him as Loki. And she's a giant. Could she be a part of this complex ass puzzle that is the Ragnarok prophecy? They make it to her treehouse where she shows him panels detailing what his future holds, and Atreus is not like what he sees. It prophesizes that his father dies, and he ends up serving Odin. This gets him so pissed that he transforms again, this time into a wolf. Anger Boda calms him down, but doesn't help the fact that his destiny is pretty fucked. To ease his mind, she brings him around the forest to accompany her with her regular chores, and in the process she helps him control his wolf morphing ability. She also reveals that he is indeed the champion of Jotnar, of which the girl of prophecy speaks of. Eventually, she shows him a pouch full of marble similar to the one that he's been carrying throughout this adventure. To Atreus' surprise, she shows him that these are what's left of the giants. When they went into hiding, they put their souls into these marbles. That's why it always seemed like the giants just vanished. After that wild revelation, Anger Boda hands them over to him, saying they're his responsibility now. With that, they leave to explore more of the forest. Atreus brings up how crazy it'll be to tell his father and friends about Ironwood, but she warns that he cannot tell a soul about this place. Then, on their way to Anger Boda's treehouse, they catch a wolf getting dragged away by someone. Turns out this someone is her grandmother, Grilla, and she spends her time snatching the souls of animals to live vicariously through them. The fuck? Atreus is not down for more animals dying, so he has to go to her place to save the wolf. There, they find multiple soulless animals, which gives Atreus an idea. He uses one of the giant's marbles to transfer a soul into a snake. It works, but the snake doesn't say anything and just leaves. This leaves Atreus hella unmotivated. He hands the pack of marbles back to Anger Boda, then they try to leave Gryla's place afterwards. But she ends up coming back at the worst time. And this lady is a true giant. She big as fuck! Anger Boda is sick of seeing animals die too though, so she distracts Grilla to give Atreus the chance to free the wolf she just captured. Unfortunately, the attempt fails. The two young giants are forced to fight Grilla, and luckily for them, they're able to destroy the cauldron she uses to harvest souls. The woman then curses them out, and lays it in on Anger Boda, saying she doesn't matter, she's just a part of Atreus' story, and soon, he would even care about her because he'll be too busy mourning his father's death. Ma'am, I know you're mad, but chill fam! Facts, this is your granddaughter you're talking to! But with that, the two giants leave. To lift their spirits, they race back to Anger Boda's place, and Atreus shows his newfound morphing expertise by racing her in his wolf form. Once back, Atreus takes another look at his prophecy. They both lament on how neither of them know what to do. Now that Anger Boda has told Atreus everything she needed to, her story is technically over, and Atreus is at a loss because he doesn't want to see his father die. However, neither of them can really do anything about it now, so Anger Boda teaches him how to leave. He has to focus on home, but this screws him up because home to him is the old cottage that he and his father used to live in. He ends up teleporting there, and is forced to fight a bunch of enemies guarding the place. After dispatching them, he tries to return to HQ, but Kratos meets him at the gate infuriated. Apparently the boy's been gone for two days. TWO DAYS! And Kratos wants to know why. Since he can't reveal the truth about Ironwood, he straight up tells Kratos that it's a secret. He just needs his trust. This leads to another argument between the two, but is cut short by more enemies. Then after dispatching them, Freya returns for the smoke. She manages to hold Kratos down, so Atreus goes into bear mode ready to end her life. But his father stops him again reminding him that Freya was once their friend. Yo, Kratos is out here showing all the growth. Understand, he's defending a god right now. A god! The god killer himself is defending what he hates the most. You love to see it. The act frustrates Freya, but she finally admits that maybe, just maybe, these guys are more useful to her alive for the time being. After Atreus morphs back, Kratos sends him back to HQ with Sindri while he talks to Freya. She tells him that she's sick of being banned from the realms, so they've got to go to Vanaheim to find the source of the magic keeping her from traveling between them. She managed to form a protection spell that can keep her in the realm while they're there. With that, her, Brock, and Kratos head to Vanaheim. They follow Freya's lead until they run into Freyr, her brother, who's not happy to see them. He's pissed at Mimir because the way he sees it, that marriage he brokered with Freya and Odin was pretty much him selling his sister for peace. Luckily, Freya pops in and clears up the situation. Freya lets his malice go, and even accepts Mimir's help when he offers to aid him in his plan to overthrow Odin. Brock sticks around Freya's camp to catch up with an old friend, and Kratos and Freya keep it pushing. On their journey, Kratos tries to give Freya some friendly advice by talking about his brother, but the goddess is still mad at him, so she pretty much ignores him. However, her attitude changes when he tells her the story about how he killed his past daughter and tore down all of Olympus because of it. He goes on to tell her that he truly does not want war with her. She helped them out, saved his son. That's why every time she attacked them, Kratos never showed any type of killing intent. So basically, Kratos still sees her as a friend. After more traveling and more talking, they find what they're looking for. World tree roots bound in knots by Odin. She tries to pull at them, but the dimensional dragon and protector of the world tree, Nidhogg, comes at them with all the malice. They work together to beat the thing, and in the process, free Freya from her realm shadow ban. With that, Kratos asks what's next. Are they fighting now or not? Nah? 
Thankfully, Freya admits that she's still pissed, but Odin should be their main target. They end up making amends, and now they're allies again. Lit. The duo returns to Freya's camp, and on the way, since they're on better terms, Freya tries to convince Kratos that this war he's so against may be necessary. Crazy how Kratos now needs people to persuade him to go to war. However, the ghost of Sparta is still against it. He doesn't have a plan B, but war is out of the question for him. Once they return to the camp, Freya welcomes them with open arms. He's like, Sis, you're back! Now we can start this war and take back what's ours. But Freya doesn't plan on staying. Ragnarok is on its way and nobody knows when it's coming. Shit, it could be tomorrow. Freya doesn't take this well, saying that all this is her maniac husband's fault. But homie's acting like she didn't do all this to make peace for her people. She argues that they all abandoned her after everything fell out. She made the ultimate sacrifice and got shafted the most, and she's not wrong. So they make up, and Freya accepts that his sister has bigger problems to deal with right now. But she's his sister, she'll be back to help him out soon. With that, they grab Rock, and the three of them return to their dwarven HQ. The first thing Kratos does is check on Atreus. And folks, the boy has lost it. He wants to go to Asgard to speak with Odin by himself. Odin! Did all that talk about this man being a sociopath not phase you, boy? Everyone tries telling him this is a dumb choice. Even Sinju, who's been his confidant this whole time. But all their arguing only angers Atreus. In a fit, he goes bear mode on them and dips to Midgard. Boy, if you don't stop running away when the end of the world is mad close. He takes refuge in Freya's old place and contemplates what his next move will be. He understands the craziness of going to Asgard, but he also feels like doing nothing will still fulfill the prophecy and cause his dad to die. He doesn't want that. Then as if on cue, one of Odin's ravens shows up. Atreus knows the Allfather is watching him now, so he's just like, fuck it, guess I'm going to Asgard. With that, the ravens teleport him to the realm of the Aesir gods. He's guided to the giant wall meant to protect the Aesir and climbs the whole thing. At the top, he's met by Heimdall, the Norse god of foresight and watchman of the Aesir. This piece of shit threatens to drop Atreus after that long-ass climb, but when the boy presents himself as Loki of the Jotnar, the watchman becomes intrigued. He takes him through their Aesir village and informs him that not all Aesir are gods, but the tour ends with him challenging Atreus to a duel, because he doesn't trust him. And people, Heimdall may be a dick, but this man bodies the shit out of Atreus and makes it look sexy. Fortunately, Thor and Odin interrupt the fight. Though Heimdall argues that this boy can't be trusted, Odin's like, Of course he can't be trusted. I didn't give him any reason to trust me. That's why I asked him to come, moron. Yo, these guys are like a dysfunctional family and it's hilarious. The Allfather continues the tour of the village for Atreus. He presses the fact that he is not his prisoner. To him, this is just a visit, a babysit that will hopefully lead to a fruitful relationship. He wants the boy to learn more about them, if anything. As he meets more of the fam, a bunch of them show their distaste for him while others are curious to learn more about him. Like Thrude, Modi's sister. At first she seems mad because Atreus was given his room, but she ends up being mad cool. Out of all the Aesir, she's actually the most welcoming. Her and Atreus have a conversation about her dreams of becoming a Valkyrie, and she even defends him when her mother tries to come at him. After spending some time with big sister Thrude, Atreus returns to Odin where he's given an enchanted sword that Allfather calls Ingrid. Weird name for a sword, but okay. He brings Atreus to another room and further instills the fact that he's not a bad guy. Or at least, he doesn't think he is. He states that what drives him is not power, wealth, or even war. It's knowledge. He wants to know what their reason for being here is. Then he shows Atreus what he's been researching for the longest. A crack in reality that they both say feels like knowledge and truth. Learning about it can teach him how to stop Ragnarok and more. The Allfather then shows him a mask giving off the same energy. Atreus takes a look at it and first notices that it's not from the Nine Realms. Odin asks him to try to read the text, and he manages to do it. The text talks about smoldered earth and a field of battles never fought. This gets the Allfather hella hype. He asks Atreus to help him figure all this out, and now that the kid's curiosity has been piqued, he accepts. With that, Odin hands him the mask and sends him and Thor to Muspelheim to find out more. There, the little giant tries to spark a conversation with Thor, but the God of Thunder is not having it. In fact, homie just seems annoyed. Well, Atreus and Kratos did kill his son. True. After some adventuring with Thor, Atreus leaves as he goes off on a horde of monsters and runs into Angerboda. She's here to look into Surtur's shrine, Surtur being the first fire giant and ruler of Muspelheim. After joking about how Atreus is kind of following his destiny and how she's making her own, they enter the shrine together. They find Surtur's marble, but his soul isn't in it, meaning he may still be alive. Then, like the shrines before this one, the duo gets a prophecy related to Ragnarok. It shows that if Surtur combines with his true love, the frost giant Sinmara, then they will become Ragnarok and destroy Asgard. After receiving this hint, Atreus leaves Angerboda and returns to Thor. He ends up finding another piece of the mask, and they head back to Asgard together. And Thor shows that he doesn't completely hate the kid now. Odin reveals that the crack in his room grew bigger because of their journey, and he's even more pleased to see that the mask he gave Atreus is closer to being complete. 
However, they still can't fully read its message. Once Thor leads them to chat, Atreus tells Odin that he wants to gain their trust, and he wants to be able to trust them. So, Odin tells him to gain his trust, he must complete the mask. Only then will he tell him more about the strange crack in his room. Back in the Dwarven HQ, Kratos comes up with his own plan. He doesn't know how to get his son back, but he knows his son is obsessed with Ragnarok. So he's going to look for the Norns, basically Norse mythology sisters of fate. Freya joins him and Mimir, and together they head to Midgard. They track the Norns down using Atreus' wolves, then after dealing with a bunch of their mind games, they find them. But these guys are worse than the Sisters of Fate. They basically narrate everything our heroes do at the moment they do it. It's like they're flaunting the fact that they know the future. They even shit on them by saying the reason they seem so omniscient is because Kratos and them keep making the same predictable decisions. It's like they're unknowingly following a script that they made themselves. The taunting ends with them telling Kratos that he will die at the end of this journey, and Heimdall plans to kill Atreus. With that, the Ghost of Sparta decides to leave, but the Norse tell him that he's too focused on the second act, and not the final, most important one. He doesn't have the patience for more riddles though, so he takes his squad and bounces. Next stop, Asgard, to kill Heimdall before he has a chance to kill Atreus. But Mimir and Freya warn that the god is no easy foe. He's able to read people's intentions in order to guess their every move. So Kratos asks Brock and Sinji for help, and the Holger brothers come in clutch again. Honestly, these guys have been two of the biggest goats in this whole adventure when you think about it. Not only have they worked as the squad's blacksmiths, but they're also the reason why they can still travel through the realms and chill in a place away from Odin's influence. What would they do without them? Anyway, as for what they're going to use to defeat Heimdall, they suggest Dropnir, a duplicating ring. But that's only part one of their plan. The next step requires someone the brothers call the Lady. With no idea who that is, Kratos and Freya join Brock and head to Svartalfheim. But Sinji doesn't want Brock going. He even follows them to Svartalfheim and begs them not to allow Brock to speak with the Lady. Sadly for him, he's ignored. As the squad searches for the Lady of Mystery, Freya takes a stab at convincing Kratos to not only help in this war, but lead the army against Odin. The conversation infuriates the retired god, so Freya gives him some space to handle her own shit. Would y'all just leave my man alone? He doesn't want to go to war. Not even knowing he's going to die is pushing him to entertain the idea. Kratos does not want the smoke. Shit, I never thought I'd say that. Yeah, sounds weird. Anyway, they find the lady who happens to be a mermaid. She takes the ring and other materials and forges an enchanted spear with the power to clone itself. However, when Brock asks her to give it a blessing, she completely ignores him. Mimir tells him that this is because a mermaid speaks to your soul. Brock puts two and two together and figures out the truth Sinji has been hiding from him for years. He died, and his brother wasn't able to get every part of his soul back. But in an extremely kind moment, Kratos asks the dwarf to bless it himself, because the only blessing he needs is that of a gifted blacksmith. And though he doesn't show it, the gesture makes Brock feel a lot better. So he blesses it, then Kratos takes it out for a spin. And fam, this shit is busted. What makes it better is that the spear was the first weapon a Spartan learned how to use. So Kratos is using the weapon he's most experienced with, and it's OP as fuck? Yo, Heimdall's about to get his ass beat. But sadly, Odin appears to kill all the hype. He informs him that his son is fine and chilling in Asgard. He even compliments the kid saying he's the key to peace among the realms. However, Kratos doesn't give a shit about what he has to say. He just wants his son back. So Odin throws some insults at him, saying this is why his son isn't in a rush to return to him. Then he leaves before Kratos rips his head off. Afterwards, they reunite with Freya and return to HQ to rest. In his dream, Kratos once again returns to his past. This time, he and Faye go on a boat trip with the baby Atreus. The dream ends with Faye telling him to protect their son. Meanwhile, back in Asgard, Atreus gives Odin another clue he found out about the mask. It hinted their next destination being Helheim. So Odin sends him, the homie Thrud, and the asshole Heimdall to the realm to investigate. Or rather, Atreus and Thrud. The moment they get there, Heimdall leaves. What a dick. As they track down the next piece of the mask, Atreus and Thrud get to talking about Odin. And apparently, she doesn't believe any of the awful things Odin did. And she refuses to believe them. So Atreus and her drop the subject. No point in them ruining their relationship because of the Allfather. Their journey brings them to a giant dog who they assume is being held against their will. But after releasing it, it goes berserk and starts tearing holes through reality. Bitch ass Heimdall returns and let them know that that dog was the Hellhound Garm. And ripping apart reality is kind of their thing. He then proceeds to taunt Thrud and Atreus for their mistake. Atreus lets it go, but his comments get to Thrud. She attempts to fight him, fails, then they all return to Asgard so Heimdall can station them with the biggest smile on his face. Screw you, Heimdall. Sadly, this puts Atreus on Thrud's bad side. Later, Odin meets him to talk about what happened. The little giant is up front with him and tells him that he screwed up and wants to go home. So Odin takes back the mask and Igrid and lets him leave. With that, he returns to HQ where he finds the place overrun by Hellwalkers. The scars in reality that Garm left is causing them to run free across the realms. 
after taking care of them, Atreus runs to hug his father, and you can tell it's taking everything for Kratos not to cry. He lets them know the mistake he made, and everyone comes at him for how stupid he's been. Everyone but Kratos. He's actually the one to shut them all up and tell them Atreus simply made a mistake, one they will fix together. So the two of them head to Helheim to try and stop Garn. On the way, they update each other on what they've been through. When they find the beast, Atreus convinces his dad to follow his lead, because he knows Kratos is about to body this thing. Kratos obliges, but the plan fails. So Kratos is like, I, my turn, finds the dog again, and immediately goes for his face. Atreus joins in the fight, and they end up snapping the dog's neck. But they get back up right after because apparently, they don't have a soul. And best believe homie got their revenge on Kratos. Gave our boy that work, son. So they keep taking down the dog, only for them to keep resurrecting. Then Atreus has an idea. Back when he was in Ironwood, Anger Boda told him that he had a soul in his knife. He didn't know what that meant then, but now he does. Back when Fenrir died, he accidentally transferred his soul to his knife using a chant. What if they put Fenrir's soul into this empty vessel? So Kratos holds the beast down, and Atreus stabs it in the head with his knife, and does another chant. Garm runs away in pain, but when they find him again, turns out the spell worked. Fenrir comes at Atreus happy to see his friend again. And fun fact, on the development side, they use an actual dog for all the mocap. That's mad cool. Kratos tells him to go home, and Homie opens up a portal to Midgard and dips. Fenrir just got the illest buff. With that, the duo leads. But before they head out the realm, Kratos stops to have quite possibly the most heartwarming conversation with his son. Like, I'm not even gonna ruin it with an explanation. Just watch. I have been falling back into my old ways. Angry, distrustful, with you, now and before. I... I chased you away. Without you, I got reckless. Overconfident, made stupid mistakes. I don't know why I thought I could do this alone. You were right. No. On our journey together, you have grown into a warrior worthy of your namesake. was the one who was not ready. You don't have to be who you were just because I'm not there. Let's make a promise. I'll listen for your voice in my head when you're not there to guide me. And you do the same. All right? I need to know you'll be okay without me. Don't be sorry, father. Be better. Bro, my heart. Like, how do you top that? Kratos' self-awareness and willingness to admit that he wasn't ready, and our boy Atreus showing his maturity by admitting that he was wrong too? And fam, the don't be sorry, be better at the end? It's like Kratos' and Atreus' relationship just came full circle. And the icing on the cake is them walking back home with their arms around each other. Santa Monica. I don't know what your writers are on, but please give me some. This is some top tier character development. Not even just in video games, in fiction in general. I don't even care if I said that in this video already because it needs to be said twice. But you know what? Just in case this was the first time, I'm gonna say it again. This is some of the best character development in fiction, period. Whew, sorry conscience, I just, 
had to get that. No, nah, no, nah, bro. I was letting you cook. This is one of those rare occasions where everything you said was actually facts. I've got nothing to add. Oh, shit. Yup. Damn. Now I feel like I gotta savage you. I mean, you don't- So after that heartwarming moment, Atreus and Kratos agree that they can make their own destinies. Then they head back to HQ. Really? Bro, don't act like you didn't know this was coming. <sighs> I mean, you're not wrong. Anyway, once they return to HQ, Atreus tells the group about where Odin is putting all of his attention, the mask. The only person who knows anything about it is Tyr. He says his origin is unknown, but there are those who believe it was a way to gaze into the secrets of creation itself. However, he doesn't know much else, so they drop it. At this point, Freya just wants to smoke, so she asks Kratos if they're going to kill Heimdall. But now that Kratos has more faith in his son, he decides that they'll do this without bringing the war to Odin. Good call too, because that would have probably ended terribly. Freya hates the change in plans though, and she remembers that her brother still needs her help, so she leaves the squad to head to Vanaheim. After Atreus spent some time doing research, he, Kratos, and Mimir head there too to check up on her. Once they return to Freya's camp, they meet a familiar face. Y'all remember that boar that Atreus almost killed in the last game? This is him, Hildis Vini. When Freya was banished to Midgard, he was too. He was trapped in his boar form though. He catches them up on the situation. Odin's forces are here and they took Freya and one of his people. On top of that, the Celestial Wolves, Skull and Hati, have been missing for days, and so was the moon. One of the prophecies they saw earlier foretold this. So Team Kratos goes looking for the dogs, while Hildas Vini returns to help Team Freya. They head to the wolves' den and find them sleeping. Good to know they're not gone gone. Now, onto finding that missing moon. The two find it after taking on more of Odin's army. Then when they release it, it eclipses the sun. Once again, just like in the prophecy. Atreus signals Skull to go chasing after the sun, turning day into night. With that, they reconvene with Freya, who knows where her brother is being held. Kratos and Mimir joins Freya to find Freya while Atreus helps out Hildas Vini. The new plan is for Team Kratos to serve as a distraction while Team Atreus sneaks and saves Freya. Team Kratos gets to their post and carry out their part of the plan. Then as if on cue, bitch-ass Heimdall shows up. Now Kratos doesn't want to face him alone because he knows he'll just be doing what the Norns said he would. However, Freya's safety matters more, so he tells Freya to leave so he and Heimdall can have their one-on-one. -on -one. By using the cloning abilities of the Shadow Clone Jutsu Spear, he manages to overwhelm him. He offers to spare his life, but Heimdall does not like this at all. So they end up fighting again, and Kratos murders a dude. And fam, it's bad. Haven't seen someone get beat by Kratos like this since he was back in the Greek world. Mimir tries to talk to him about it, but it's obvious to see the shit broken. Regardless, he needs to move. He takes Heimdall's Galahorn, rejoins his allies, saves Freyr, and together they escape on Freyr's flying boat. When they return to camp, Kratos lets his son know what he had to do, and luckily Atreus reassures him saying it was done because it had to, not because it was written. With that, everyone returns to the Dwarven HQ to talk about what's next. Kratos shows them Galahorn, proving that Heimdall is dead. But this means war is inevitable. Tyr lets him know whatever peace Odin wants, it's not gonna happen now that Kratos spilled Aesir blood. So, Atreus suggests that he go back to Asgard. If he's able to decipher the mask, then they might have a chance. Kratos doesn't like the idea, but the rest of the group agrees that this is their best move, so he reluctantly goes along with it. To head back to Asgard, he must first speak to Odin's raven at he and his dad's old cabin. He gets there and reunites with Fen and Angerboda. She presents his marble to him, then asks where he's heading off to. Then she gives him the stank face once he says Asgard. The little homie explains that though this may seem dumb, doing this may help him find a way to save his father, stop Ragnarok, and bring their people back. But Angerboda stresses that this is the Allfather they're talking about. Anything involving him usually leads to bad. Nevertheless, she lets him go and promises to take care of Fen while he's away. Funny thing about this is that in Norse mythology, Loki and Angerboda were actually lovers, one of their children being Fenrir. So watching Angerboda and Atreus take care of him is sort of like a nod to their Norse relationship. Anyway, after the convo, Atreus heads back to Asgard to speak with Odin. He tells him that he mistranslated a part of the mask. Once he tells him the correction, the Allfather informs him that this means they need to go to Niflheim. So he gets Ingrid back and goes looking for Thor to go on another excursion. Dude helps him find her father in a bar, getting shit-faced. Then his belligerent attitude starts a bar fight. After destroying the whole place, Atreus and Thrud help the drunk god of thunder get out the bar. Then, Thrud gives him a stern talking to. Turns out Thor has been down bad lately. Odin treats him like shit, so he drowns his sorrows with alcohol. After the speech, she leads them to go on their mission. While they travel through Niflheim, Atreus access Thor's much-needed therapist, and they start bonding because of it. But all that bonding comes to an end when they find the last mask piece. Odin comes in and congratulates Atreus on his accomplishment. But Thor's wife comes in and straight up snitches on Atreus for being partially responsible for Heimdall's death. But in a hilarious turn of events, Odin shows that he doesn't really give a fuck. He got his mask. So Thor's wife goes to Thor like, my man, that boy and his father killed our kids. 
Yeah, you're here going on adventures with him? What if he kills through next? The words get Thor all riled up, and he starts coming at Atreus. Thankfully, before Atreus left, Sinji gave him an escape tool. So right when Thor tries to attack him, he uses the teleport back to HQ. With the boy back, the squad once again gathers at the round table to discuss what they should do next. Y'all already know Freya is down for the smoke, so she suggests they get Surtur, use Galahorn, and bring the fight to Odin. However, Tyr counters with something different. They have the mask, so why don't they just sneak into Asgard and use it right under Odin's nose? But now that Atreus burned his bridges, they have no way back to Asgard. Then, all of a sudden, Tyr decides to become useful. He calls himself out for not being of much help until now, but he believes this is his destiny. He will lead them into Asgard. But the homie Brock raises a very good point. If he had a way to get to Asgard this whole time, why the fuck didn't he say anything until now? Tyr says that he was waiting for Atreus to be sure about his destiny, but Brock sees this as more excuses. Plus, he mentions how this whole time the god only called him Loki, never by his real name. Then, the unthinkable happens. Tyr stabs Brock and reveals that he's been Odin this whole time. I had a feeling this man was sus. He attempts to hold Atreus hostage and bargains for the mask, but they manage to overwhelm him. Then when he leaves, he confirms that this means war. With that, Brock dies in his brother's arms, telling him he knows that he revived them before, but this time he has to let him go. The death destroys the team's spirits. Freya and Freya are still down for war, but Atreus is too shocked, so Kratos takes his son home. The little giant asks to go hunting, but when they find their prey, Kratos stops him. He explains that what they're doing is running. They can't just hunt their pains away and wait for the inevitable. So they return to Sinji to try and apologize, but he doesn't accept it. His brother's death really messed him up. They then return to the rest of their allies to go over how they're going to engage in this war. Since Odin already knows their plan, their only hope is to unite the realms they can against Odin and recruit Surtur. Freya decides to go to Alfheim to recruit the elves, Freya to Vanaheim to recruit the freed Valkyries. And though Sindri is in the worst mood possible, he makes it his mission to get Svartalfheim on their team. Kratos, Atreus, and Mimir help Hildesvini and Helheim to recruit Surtur and his army. But the giant doesn't want to help because if he fuses with his love, she'll die. They're desperate, but not desperate enough to tell a giant to sacrifice his wife, so they begin to leave. But he stops them after noticing Kratos' blaze of chaos. He says that because of their primordial flame, they can be used to turn him into the monster they seek. He currently has his love's frozen heart in his chest, and she has his. So if he lends his powers to the blades and they stab his heart, that may be enough to get the fusion they're looking for. And it would keep his lover safe. With that, they head to a place called the Spark of the World. The giant absorbs some of the spark's flames and puts them into the blades. Then, Kratos stabs him, and the transformation begins. But before it can finish, Valkyries show up to try and stop them. The two manage to beat them using Kratos' rage and Atreus' bear mode. Following this, they call Surtur, who now addresses himself as Ragnarok. He says he awaits their call to destroy Asgard. Now, it's time for war. Well, time for rest first. They head back to Freya and rest at their new base camp. In his dream, Kratos lives through the moment where Faye told him what she wants him to do when she dies. The dream gives him more motivation to see this war through. And on the next morning, they head to Tyr's temple. And now is time for war. You're goddamn right. Kratos uses Galahorn and together, the squad rushes into Asgard. Freya calls on Ingrid because apparently, this was a sword the whole time. No wonder I liked Atreus so much. The war rages on, but shit starts falling apart mad quick. Odin's army doesn't really die, so it's easy for them to overwhelm Kratos' army, even with the help of the World Serpent and above Fenrir. And to make shit worse, Sindri shows up alone. He manages to destroy the weapons the dwarves built for Odin, but at the cost of killing a bunch of innocent Midgardians, who never wanted any of this. The scene shakes Atreus to his core. He tries to close his heart to it, but Kratos calms him and tells him that he was wrong. Atreus' empathy is his greatest strength. He wants him to open his heart and face the problems in front of him. He calls in the rest of their allies, and they change plans again. Kratos wants him to save the innocent lives caught in this crossfire. He and Atreus will breach the walls themselves. With that, they break again, but a falling wall splits Atreus and his father up. Alone, he runs into through it at the worst time. And best believe she's pissed that Atreus betrayed them. Little homie tries to plead his case, saying Odin is actually evil as shit, but she refuses to believe him. Then out of all the people, Rude's own mother defends Atreus. She tells her daughter that without Odin, they can be a real family, and she even shows her approval of Thrud's dream to become a Valkyrie. That's all the convincing Thrud needs, so she joins Atreus in his effort. With Sindri's help, they destroy the wall to Asgard and continue the raid, but Thor comes in for his rematch. However, something interesting happens before this. Remember that snake that Atreus put a giant soul in? It turns out that snake was the younger world serpent. He grew at a normal rate after him and Atreus' meeting and joining the war, but while fighting Thor, he gets sent back to the past. So the world serpent they met before is actually this one. That's why he mentioned Ironwood when him and Sindri went to talk to him. 
Anyway, back to Thor, Kratos and Mimir try to convince him that they don't have to do this. They can jump Odin together, but the God of Thunder is too angry to care. Then after another fire as hell battle, Kratos manages to subdue Thor so they can just talk. He puts his weapons away and tells them no more. They may have been savages in the past, but what matters now is what they do with their future. And for their children, they must be better. The message gets to the Norse God, but Odin appears tight that his son fell for the talk no jutsu. This man's dead like, you talked? Who told you to do that? He commands his son to pick up Mjolnir and kill Kratos, but Thor says no, so Odin kills his ass. Dude and Atreus show up just in time to see the murder. Dude tries to attack her grandfather, but he pushes her away with her father's hammer. Now, it's time for the original team, Kratos, Mimir, and Atreus, to jump the shit out of Odin. But even with all the damage they do, Odin manages to lock them down. Fortunately, Freya shows up with a binding spell to keep Odin in check, but because she spends a little too much time talking, Odin manages to throw them all into his personal study. This separates the crew. When Atreus gets up, the first thing he spots is the crack that Odin spent his life researching. Odin appears trying to convince Atreus to help him see the secrets of the universe. However, our boy knows better than that. He breaks the mask, closing the green rift forever. With that, Odin loses it, and the battle continues, this time with Freya joining the boys to help. Then after another boss fight, Odin is finally defeated. Atreus tries to tell him that it's not too late. He could still change, but Odin straight up like, no I can't. So using his special soul transferring chant, he moves Odin's soul to one of the giant marbles he got. It's given to Freya since she was after Odin the most, but she gives it back to Atreus. She doesn't need his soul to be whole. Sindri has other plans though. He grabs the marble, destroys it, then dips. With that, Ragnarok appears. Anger Boda and Fenrir come in to help them get out, but Freya is forced to hold Ragnarok back. Kratos beckons to his son, but instead of following them, Atreus pushes Kratos into Fen's portal. Sometime later, he wakes in the Hult and checks up on everyone. Thrud and her mother are fine, and they actually plan on working together with Hilda Zvini to rebuild Vanaheim. That's dope. Also, Thrud eventually finds Thor's hammer and becomes the new god of thunder. Freya and Mimir share a touching moment with him, telling him how proud they are of his endeavors, and Atreus thanks him for their help. They're truly like a family to him now. Next are Anger Boda and Fenrir, who are both chillin'. Kratos shows up soon afterwards and together they follow Anger Boda. She has nothing to show them. She guides them to another shrine, Fae's Shrine. It shows that Fae destroyed Atreus' shrine because she wanted them to form their own path. She went against her people to protect them. Afterwards, Anger Boda leaves them to talk about their future. Atreus tells his father that there are other giant souls out there and he needs to find them. And though his dad doesn't want to see him go, he understands that he needs to let Atreus live his own life. So after sharing one last tender moment together, they split up. After his son leaves, he checks the back of the shrine to see another path, one telling him that he will become the Allfather of the Nine Realms. Freya and Mimir meet him at the shrine entrance, and they decide to rebuild the realms together. But first, they head back to Svartalfheim for Brock's funeral. Once they see him off, Sinji disappears again, still broken by his brother's death. Kratos promises to maintain his house until he's ready to return. Oh, and for those wondering about Tyr, like the real Tyr, Kratos, Freya, and Mimir end up finding him in prison in Niflheim. He thanks them for freeing the realms from Odin's grasp, and ends up traveling the realms himself once he's freed. And with that, we have finally come to the end of the God of War story. Alright, so originally I did some regular regular outro that honestly, as I was editing this, I looked back at it and it, it was trash. It was trash, bro. I'm going to be real with you. So after editing this video, as I'm watching my render fail for the second time, I am re-recording this outro because I got to talk to you guys, bro. Normally, after Honest Gaming History, I just kind of, you know, eh, cool, I did it, lit. Even, like, the Street Fighter Honest Gaming History, I was really proud of, don't get me wrong. But, like, mostly, after I finish it, I edit it and all that good stuff, I just kind of post it, and I'm like, all right, cool, it's there, you know? But this video took so much, took so much of me, bro. Like, I, I've been working on this shit for months. I, I have been working on this shit since right after the Street Fighter video came out, actually. I pretty much the same month the Street Fighter video came out, I started working on this Honest Game, this God of War Honest Gaming History. So the amount of work, effort, pain, tears, all that, 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 that it took to make this video. And like, even though the render is failing, to see that the edit is done, I am very proud of this video, bro. I, I don't care if this video does not get a lot of views. I don't care. I don't even care if like some people are like, oh, you got this shit wrong because I am extremely, extremely fucking proud of this video, bro. And I am so happy that I got the chance to delve into Kratos' story because 2023 has been really, really difficult. I don't know about you guys, but it has been rough for me. 
but um this story it taught me a lot of lessons and it gave me a lot of hope to the point where writing the script felt really good and even editing the script felt really good bro when i got to the god of war 4 and ragnarok part and i saw all the like really wholesome moments with kratos and atreus i was losing it fam watching that conversation at the end in ragnarok another time had me shook i was really over here about to tear up while i was editing looking at the scene that i already saw like three times but all that is to say that you know thank you santa monica bro thank you so much for making this game you guys i don't know how you were able to do it and this this story has been right under my nose and it's crazy that like it took me the third time into going into a story i mean third time in with ragnarok but like third time going into this story to really see the beauty in it bro and ah the closing with ragnarok and I i'm sure there's probably gonna be more god of war i'm not sure this is over for the series but the closing for ragnarok fam like i appreciate it so much and this is coming from someone who has to study the game off of the cutscenes. i didn't even get to play the game yet i just appreciate the story so much so i can only imagine when i'll be able to play the game because whew, that's gonna hit different. And I already know, it doesn't matter if I saw the scene already, I'll still get emotional from it because Ragnarok is too beautiful to not, not feel something for, you know? But nah, Santa Monica, thank you so much for doing what you do, fam. Please make more God of War, write more top tier stories because this is just amazing. Thank you guys for watching this video. Thank you guys so much. Um, anybody who watches this, it means a lot. If you got to this part, and you're still watching after sitting with me and listening to me talk about God of War for two plus hours, you are still here. You are the fucking go, and I appreciate you so much. Patrons, of course, I appreciate you guys. I appreciate all the people that have been just jumping in to support on Patreon. Thank y'all so much, fam. It has been helping out so much. Y'all the greatest. Shout out to you guys, too. And y'all know, you know, like the video, comment what else you want to see, all that good stuff. But this outro, I mainly want to tell you. I appreciate y'all. I'm proud of this video. And Santa Monica did some God-tier shit when they made God of War. All right. Peace out, y'all. Have a good one.